This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. It is a scorching hot day in the African bushveld. This is Safari Live. I am in the middle of one of the true wilderness areas left in the world. This is the most mind-blowing wildlife experience you could ever hope to have. You are alive, you are alive. Everybody, we are live, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, and you can also follow us on YouTube chat. My name is Noelle, and we have Jean Dre on camera. It is hot, it is warm out here in the Lowfeld. We were just watching a little Crested Franklin, and it's busy. I don't actually know what the term is, but they do this funny thing with their with their throat when they're very, very hot to help cool themselves down. Um, so we are just going to travel through this little dip here and come around. We might lose a little bit of signal, but we're going to see if we can find anything mud wallowing or any more birds, maybe some birds resting in the shade, and see what happens on this very, very, very hot day. It's about 34 degrees Celsius, which would make it about 88 Fahrenheit. So yeah, it's warm. It is very, very very warm. Okay. Here we go. So yeah, it's warm. Looking in the shade for creatures is the best thing on a day like this. Because remember, a lot of the animals that we're viewing here in, in the Lowfeld, well, anywhere in Africa, don't sweat like we sweat. So we get rid of all of our perspiration. Oh, here we go. This is not an animal, but I've been wanting to do this. Herbie showed me this super amazing bush the other day that was new for me. I know lots, but I by all means don't know everything. And this is a dwarf scotia. So a scotia would also be a weeping bourbine. Very similar flowers, but that red color is just absolutely amazing. I don't know enough about it. It is something that I have to do some research on. Um, but yeah, just from a pretty factor, Nice, very nice. And you'll notice as we get closer into uh, into the middle of summer, everything's going to start flowering at different times and it's basically to provide food source for animals, not just like there's a little ant that's there, um, food source for animals, insects, mammal species, bird species throughout the seasons. To give to help sustain not just the bare minimum, but, but the diversity of species. So we were talking a little bit the other day with Tristan's Drive about species diversity. Mara, the Mara has a, uh, a high species richness and we have a high species diversity. So while we're busy trying to find the diversity that we can offer here in, in the Lowfeld, we're going to head over to Tristan and see what's happening with his time-lapse cameras for Sebastian and what he's finding on the other side of the reserve. So we will enjoy ourselves as I'm sure you're all going to enjoy the drive. It's your birthday. It's your birthday for like another 12 hours. What can we get up to to make Tristan giggle for his birthday? That's all something we can we can think about for our next next little segment. Okay. Species diversity, come out. Ooh. Do you know what I would really like to see, to be honest with you, besides the wallowing, is maybe if we can find elephants doing some sunbathing as well. So yeah, let's head on over to to Tris and see what he's up to. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to a blazing, hot, beautiful Juma Game Reserve. It is a stunning, stunning day. There's not a cloud in the sky, there's a little breeze and it just feels like a great time to be alive. Now, this is live, this interview is interactive, so remember hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or YouTube chat. But before we even get into all of that, I've completely forgot to introduce myself. As Noel mentioned, my name is Tristan and on camera today we have Senzo and the three fingers as per normal. Hello Senzo. So sorry about that everybody. I don't know why I forgot about my name. I was too excited to be introducing the beautiful day that we're having because it is just the most wonderful weather to be out. Probably a little warm to be out just yet, but still very, very nice nonetheless. Now, like I said, 
we are going to try and sort of check around shady areas because it is so hot. I want to try quickly go to Treehouse Dam just because I need to do our time lapse and so Senzo needs to jump off and do that and then after that I think we're going to head probably down towards maybe Twin Dams, a little bit of the Mulawati Sea, maybe if Hosanna came north, also if there's any Ellie's around. Lots of elephant tracks from last night, I know there were elephants at the dam yesterday, elephants around Treehouse and all over the, the place and so Hopefully with this hot weather that's caused the Ellie's to come down to some of these water points and we'll get lucky with them Failing all of that. Well, I think they're late this afternoon I want to try and head towards the hyena den go and check up what's happening that side If Noel's not that way and then maybe just maybe Mvula comes back after those fresh tracks that we had yesterday uh, Oh, I'm sorry this morning that went northwards into Bufuzuk I want to try and go and follow up on those and see what's happening, but it promises to be a good one I've also got a drive now that I've got to try and find a woodland Kingfisher because I said woodland Kingfisher on the 6th now I have seen a woodland Kingfisher already but I haven't got it on camera so it doesn't count until it's on camera according to the rest of the crew which is fairly true I would imagine I would also argue the same point and so my mission today is to try and find a woodlands and get it on camera as well so that I can win the bet because so far I'm two out of three of our little competitions that we've had so I've had the rain bet the impala lamb bet and now hopefully they'll get the woodlands now, it's not just myself and Noel out here, there is also the other bearded warrior, but he's on the other side of Africa, he's up in the east plains of Kenya, and he is wanting to say hello, so let's quickly jump across to Scotty B. Well, I hope Tristan gets lucky on his birthday with finding you a Woodlands Kingfisher. Here in the Maasai Mara, it's not as hot and sunny as it is at Juma. We've already had a bout of rain which caused us to drop our rain covers and as you can see there's quite a lot more rain out there which is to the north of us and often that rain will continue south to where we are here. How awesome is that? You can actually see where the rain begins and ends and it's making its way towards us. So even though it's not raining right this second, we are going to keep our flaps down because I think that storm is going to catch us shortly. But what we're going to try and do is head south and run away from it. My name's Scott. I'm teamed up with Manu on camera. And it's just myself out this afternoon in the Mara. Taylor is having a much needed break. And I think her and Davi, the one cameraman, have headed off to do some safari parkour. Where they go running and jumping over rocks and through the riverine areas to get some exercise so that's what they're up to and she didn't have the most successful morning out here today she doesn't have she didn't have too much info for me i was also had the morning off so we'll just head out and see what we can find good stuff we are going to send you back to noel who has found you some warthog Hello everyone, we have, we have found some very hot warthogs. We're just trying to find the best shot for you and they are inching a little bit to the right but the problem is, is that the shadow that they've found to rest in and be not so hot is a little bit difficult for the camera. So I'm just going to try to very carefully move without chasing them away. So warthogs is something that we see often but you would actually be amazed at not just for us but for if you're here for photography how difficult it is to actually photograph warthog you see that so they waited until i moved got into a perfect position and then they decided to run away so hopefully they come out into the road come warthogs come into the road near that impala i can see you wanting to all right well, if nothing else, there is that beautiful little Paula. Here they come, here they come. There we go, perfect. Little tails in the air so that they don't get caught by something like a cheetah that's chasing them. And now they've relaxed, tails down. But Tristan has one of my favorite species over by him, a tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny baby elephant. So I think let's head over that side and see what Tristan has to say about that gorgeous little creature. 
Well, we have the cutest, cutest little baby elephant that's just come from Treehouse Dam. So it's just sitting with mom. They're completely separate from a herd. So there's no other sign of a herd in this area, which means that I think that this little one is fairly new. I wonder, it's a little bit wobbly on its feet. It's still kind of trying to work things out. Mom is guiding it along. You can see it's kind of falling over a little bit as it tries to move and ears are going full tilt to try and cool itself down. But it is super cute. I haven't seen a baby Ellie this small in a long time and like I say it's so so cool this little one has kind of just come out of the mud it's been obviously mud wallowing with mom mom's been showing it how to stay nice and cool in hot conditions like this and what I was saying about checking the water holes is paying off this is exactly what you would see normally at hot days like this is big an animals so elephants and buffalo spending a lot of time around water to try cool themselves down and it's vitally important that mom teaches this little baby how to be able to keep cool and to be able to stay cool in hot weather like this ultimately this little baby I can tell you right now has never experienced summer before so I reckon it's probably only a few days old given how wobbly it is and how it's trying to stay up with mom the whole time now I'm gonna just sneak a little bit further forward so that we can keep up with it but I don't want to stress it too much so once it gets into a little thicket we're going to leave it there because at the end of the day we don't want too much of a stress put on her. Now, I believe a lot of you are ooing and aahing over the cuteness. It is a cuteness overload, that is for sure. This little one is super sweet. And it's amazing when you see them. Look, it even still fits under its mom. It can walk in and out completely. And you see what it's doing? It's using its mother for shade. So it knows that mom, being a large object, can provide shade. And that's why when they're born, they are able to fit underneath their mothers. They are able to get under, even in the hottest part of the day, when there's not too much of a shadow cast, she can still get underneath or he, depending if it's a little male or female, and got hide under the mom's body for a little bit of shade and to stay nice and cool. But it is definitely a tiny individual. You can see very wobbly and unsure on its feet. It's not able to actually be able to kind of keep itself together. And I think that this little elephant was born probably overnight last night because the thing is, is yesterday we have had no elephants around here anywhere. Yesterday there was massive herd of elephants here. They were very uneasy. Their demeanor was that of something concerning them. I was parked very far away from them and they were heads up ears out the whole herd seemed to be unsettled now we come to treehouse day the following day treehouse dam should i say the following day and there's a little baby elephant that is still wobbling and no sign of the rest of the herd so i think this little one was born yesterday and i think that's why it's only 24 hours old so Francis from Israel, you think you can see the umbilical cord? Well, that would make sense. If it was born yesterday, it most certainly will still have that attached, but it is just the cutest little thing in the whole world. I'm gonna try and just catch up because there's a really big tree there that I think they might sit under and just chill in the shade for a little bit and maybe mom will start feeding. So I'm just gonna try and sneak up in there. It's not too thick. I'm not gonna hit any trees or anything like that and disturb her too much. Ultimately, if I see her carrying on moving, I'll leave her, but it's just such a cute little animal to start our safari. And what good luck. It was had the most incredible week this week with baby animals it's been just the most fantastic time we've had baby hippo baby crocodiles plover babies we've had obviously shadows cub elephant baby it's all happening it's just been the best best time and that's why I love this time of the year is because you do see all of these baby animals I even forgot our little impala lamb the first impala lamb of the season as well so it's just been an absolutely kind of amazing week as we've discovered so many new little characters that have joined our safari live family now let's see if we can just sneak in here. Mom seems to be absolutely relaxed with us. She's in no way turned towards me. There's been no issue with her kind of facing me, ears out or anything like that. So she seems to be unperturbed, which is good. You always need to watch mom's reaction, particularly when you approach a tiny little baby. And mom is right here in the shade, just like I thought she might be. I thought she would get into this situation where there's a big jackalberry and the perfect shade for a little one. Hello, little one. Welcome to the world. How cute is that? You can see it's underneath mom. It's just working things out. A little bit of a sniff every now and then. It's trying to use its little trunk as well. You can imagine this trunk must be so foreign for a little one. If you think about us as, as children and as babies, we have no idea how to even walk or talk or coordinate ourselves. We rely on mom to feed us. Yet this little one who's got more muscles in the trunk than in our entire body is still able to move, suckle, feed, kind of bath and mud bathe and yet it's still trying to work out the trunk as well so it's just incredible how they're able to do all of this with so many muscles that they look for or that they have absolutely unbelievable it's so cute 
I mean, the survival rate for baby Ellie's is very good. Uh, the, what the percentage is, I'm not quite sure over the Kruger Park system, but I can tell you that it is probably in the high, I would say, 80%. Um, very seldom do you find dead baby Ellie's. The only time you get it is if there's been maybe some sort of complication with the, the delivery of that baby that maybe has caused an issue, or if there's been a really bad drought, you will sometimes get a situation where you do get um, stillborn babies. It does happen from time to time. In fact, actually, yesterday, Day, there was a stillborn giraffe on on Biffle's hook and I'm sure it's still got to do with the, the sort of lack of nutrients that has been around over these dry last dry period but very very seldom do we see stillborn illies it's it's not the most common thing elephants don't suffer from too many diseases they generally are very good at finding food and water even in the harshest times you'll find an elephant will be able to dig it will be able to get roots it will be able to get tubers it will strip bark leaves grass so it, it's able to still function even in the dry periods and it will dig for water as well if water is not available so very seldom do we see dead elephants and then on top of that you see a situation where there's very few predators of a baby elephant so things like jackals hyenas lion leopard these kind of things have got to get through mom and mom is going to seriously be defensive of a tiny baby like that i'm actually impressed at how relaxed she is with us she's completely unprotected she's busy feeding which is as soon as you see an elephant feeding you know that you're generally okay they, they, when they're feeding like that they are comfortable with your presence you can see she actually hasn't even faced us once she's been moving around with the little calf and I'm sure she's enjoying the bit of shade that this jackalberry is offering now you see the little one is kind of constantly in and amongst her feet and around her front feet and is watching her all the time it's kind of checking out how is mom doing things and that's how they learn so it's an animal that learns a lot from its parents and learns by sight and so it'll stop and it'll watch and it will play and it will use its trunk a little bit until it's able to work those kind of things out which is super cool but what a special special way to start our day now I know a lot of you are saying that it is a great birthday present but I feel like I've been spoiled this whole week with birthday presents and many new Scorpios in the world this week of well especially in the natural world like I say we've got Pebbles the plover we've got our croc little babies we've got little Boo the hippo who's also a November baby and now our little Ellie so and the Impala lamb as well so we've had lots of tiny babies that have joined me and it is a gift I mean to see something like this is incredibly special not only to to see it but also to be able to spend time in the company of an elephant mother who's so trusting of us and is allowing us these views of this little baby is incredibly special we're very fortunate to be able to spend time with animals like this and to be able to learn from them and watch them and kind of see her as she introduces her baby to the world and to show it around and this will all be new areas for this baby so she's taking it along slowly just to explore and it's going to be showing it how to live how to survive and those kind of things are super special now I'm just gonna try and go forward a little bit you see what she's doing though she as she's walking there's a lot of debris in this section here and that debris is very very good because what happens is things grow underneath the debris so she can move things away and she's able to then get food now Romit, the baby Ellie will start feeding on its own when it reaches anywhere between sort of I would say 18 months and two years and they start to be able to feed by themselves they're still supplemented by mom's milk up until two years that's when they start to kind of wean off it I have seen elephants that are older still suckling from mom particularly if she has another calf then you'll find that some of the older ones will try and steal milk from time to time from their mom but generally they are able to start feeding and are fairly self-sufficient already at two years so it's a long way away from now that this little baby will be feeding by itself but time will come or oh, is it going to lie down i think it might just lie down for us look it's just putting its head down to the ground little legs are buckling a bit oh there we go oh no it's just been too long a day it's too hot <laughs> that's just so cute now this little one will lie like this because it is a warm day and mom is right near the termite mound it's shady there's a little breeze blowing here it is the perfect place to have a little rest and little babies when they're walking around you can imagine it's difficult for them mom you know she's used to standing she's been alive for many years and this little one is now kind of come into this world and it doesn't really you know it's trying to keep up with mom it's exercising but the legs are still not that strong and trying to keep up with one of mom steps is like taking 10 of her own or his own depending if it's a little boy or a girl I can't see it looks like a little boy and so it's a tough life to keep up with mom and so every now and then you will find them sleeping and what you will also find is that this little baby when she when it sleeps like that mom will stay very very close they'll feed very close and she'll I think probably try and move quite quickly today to catch up with the herd which I'm 
hoping is not too far away. She'll then kind of smell and sniff and communicate. Remember, they have incredible communication that they're able to kind of get into, well, to talk to each other from big distances. And so she'll catch up with the herd. Once she's with the herd, you'll find this little baby might lie down and the whole herd will actually stop and feed in that area and give a chance for that little baby to rest. And it looks like it's trying to suckle. So it's just trying to get some of that vitally nutrient rich milk to be able to get the strength to carry on and keep moving. Paul, no. So I honestly have never, ever, ever, ever heard of a case of elephant triplets, and I'll tell you why. There's just, I don't think, enough space inside of a female elephant to have a triplet situation. I do know of twins. I have seen twins myself down in the south of the Sabi Sands. Two elephants, same age, suckling from the same mother and her protecting those two and always walking with those two. So twins has happened. It's very seldom that twins do happen, but it has happened. Things like triplets, I doubt it's even possible. Remember that these elephants are massive at birth they are huge already the female and is under huge stress by having one of these calves you can imagine two but three is just probably not possible they do this their stomach will well they're not their stomach but their cavities will not be able to hold such a large amount um, and will not be able to have enough space really to to sustain that also to give enough nutrients to three of those babies at that size would just be almost impossible and she doesn't have enough teats for her she's only got two teats which means that if she had three she's going to really struggle to be able to feed all three of those but i'm super surprised at how relaxed this little baby is i mean the plane has just come over it's probably the first time it's ever heard the plane and it is not running or it's not kind of flapping its ears or anything like that it's taking its cue from mom who's completely relaxed which is just wonderful now i know senza doesn't have the best view of the little one so i'm just going to slightly reposition myself because we'll have a nice view if i just go forward a little bit and we can just get around this little bush but after they go from here then i'm going to probably not spend too much more time with them because i don't want to go through the thickets and annoy anybody in this process but there we go that's a little bit better it does look like a little male from what I can see. It looks as though it's difficult obviously with male elephants and, and, and female elephants at a baby as a young age because I remember little male elephants have internal testes so not very easy to be able to tell but it looks like a little male and it looks like that little umbilical cord is still attached so it was really good observation. It seems as though there's a small little part of it still there. How wonderful to see. Hello little one. She must have given birth somewhere in this area and that, that really explains a lot about yesterday's behavior with that herd. I remember getting back to camp last night and I was saying it was super strange that the Aries were so unrelaxed and they were so kind of feisty and they were, as I drove up, all of them were kind of huddled in small groups and everybody was a little bit on the sort of aggressive side or not aggressive side but they were very showy. Their heads were up, ears were out, they didn't let me get anywhere near them but it explains all of that behavior right now because obviously when there's a new baby there's a lot of communication that's going and a lot of interesting things that are happening and the whole herd's a bit freaked out because there'll be this new addition there's scent of you know blood and all kinds of other things there's also noise from that female as she gives birth and this new baby that's out and so that unsettles the herd quite a bit and they know then also that they have to be far more alert and far more defensive because now there's a little baby amongst them the opportunity for predators to come in and go at that baby is quite real and so they've got to make sure that they protect this little one as a unit and it's not just up to the mother the whole herd will be very protective of this little one and make sure that it survives and so yesterday's behavior is completely natural now and makes so much more sense than what we saw or well, than what I thought yesterday afternoon so very cool to witness and to see that process between them now I'm pretty sure this little one was born somewhere in this little vicinity so in this drainage line area there's nice shady spots that this mother would have had her baby and and would have had it kind of under some shady trees yesterday or even overnight like I said and then she would have moved towards the water today just to rehydrate also to introduce this little baby to water and cool it down at the end of the day it must be really overheating in hot weather like this but you are just too cute little one I feel like you may have stolen the hearts of many out there already it's going, to be in, it's going to be fairly easy actually to recognize this adult female as well because she's got a missing left 
tusk and she's also got a very big deep notched V out of her right ear so we should be able to kind of recognize her there you can see the V that I'm talking about and that missing left tusk those two combination should be able to recognize her so we should be able to keep tabs on this little one over the next little bit and see if she actually hangs around here or if she's going to be fairly transient in her movements right our little one is going to move off into the thickets I'm not going to follow any further but what we can do is send you all the way back to the Masai Mara with Scotty D who I think is still driving around and hopefully he's going to have a lot more luck than he's had over the past couple of days well we, we decided to put up the rain covers as you can see but it was at a bad time it looked like most of the rain was behind us but now we are getting wet so we're probably gonna have to drop the rain covers again <laughs> and continue with them down try and snipe out the sides it just becomes very difficult to to spot things if the flaps are down if you've already established a sighting then you can work with it but searching with those flaps down is very very tricky so that is our predicament. It seems like we're going to have a wet afternoon here in the Mara. Very, very exciting stuff with Tristan and that baby elephant. Sounds very, very cute and also useful that it sounds like you'll be able to keep track of who it is because its mother's got a very distinctive notch in her ear. So that's a great start to the safari. I think I'm going to have take the river road. We've got two main options as we head out of camp into areas where we can off-road. One is the escarpment road, which follows the Ololo escarpment, which you can see over there. And the other one is via the Mara River Circuit, which is 17 kilometers long. And that will take us to a camp called Serena, where I plan on going and buying some toothpaste. <laughs> <laughs> They've got a staff shop there, so you can stock up on basic bits and pieces like toothpaste, deodorant. Well, it seems like elephants are the flavor of the day down in Juma. Why don't you go and see what Noel's herd is up to? Welcome back, everyone. We have found animals and one of my favorites. So I was super excited about Tristan's tiny, tiny little baby elephant. We don't have any super teeny ones, but we do have some younger ones. Uh, you can see there's a big female to, just to the right here that's resting in the shade, trunk all the way down, eye half closed, just enjoying and keeping, keeping a, an eye on her family. And then panning down towards the dam we've got a few that are feeding that way and there's a nice sized bull he's not very big but on the left hand side there's a decent sized bull that's there beautiful breeding herd of elephants i love elephants and especially when it's warm like this <clears throat> this is one of what i would consider a go-to animal when it's warm and you're out and you want to just sit in the shade and watch what's happening because they're going to give you all the entertainment you need and look at that little one that little one's gonna come down and join that older one they practice so they they mimic each other so whatever the older ones are eating especially what mom's eating then they'll practice eating but what you'll notice as well is with the younger males <laughs> like that tiny one they want to mimic the older males it's like with humans when if you're a 10 year old boy and you have a 16 year old cousin you want to do everything that that 16 year old cousin does Uh, Roxa, I believe you said, how do elephants keep cool? Elephants use their ears to, they flap them to help get the heat away from their brain using the, the different um, uh, veins and blood vessels. They also love to swim, absolutely love to swim, and they'll throw mud on themselves as well as throwing dust on themselves, how they keep themselves cool. Great question. Sorry, it's so it's a little bit windy, but it's very warm. But it, the wind is feeling like a 
like a really, this is so funny, like a really gentle caress over your face right now. It's just a perfect summer's afternoon, absolutely perfect. Jandre, did you see that little male? He's, ta he's taking sticks and just throwing them around just because he can. Watch, 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 watch. <laughs> Sorry, so I went from a very super calm, calm moment to an absolute hysterical moment with this little male here. Or sorry, little female, excuse me. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> he's so indecisive. Do you see that? He can't really decide what he wants to do. Does he want to turn? Does he want to play? Again, very similar to human children. They'll play with each other, elephant calves, but then they'll also play by themselves. So you can only just imagine what he's thinking in his head there. He's trying to pick up mom's foot's in the way a little bit, but he's trying to pick up that little stick. I once watched elephants doing that with, um, with pebbles, picking them up, putting them in their mouths, and then throwing them out, and then picking them up, putting them in their mouths, throwing them out. There he's testing, he's scratching himself now. So if we go <clears throat> down the road a bit, you can see the ones that were already drinking. So Luke, you're wondering if elephants can fend off a predator with the blow from its trunk. Look, an elephant, Luke, an elephant is super strong. I'm not gonna lie, look at them greeting. Sorry, I just, if we have a look down the road there, Jandre, these ones have just come out of the water and then that other one went up to greet. So with this small little herd that's pulled up and this other one to our right, there's actually another herd that's behind us as well. Um, <clears throat> And we're looking at about 30 elephants here. And sometimes in a scenario like this, what you're seeing is you're seeing herds that used to be one herd and then gr uh, got too big and then split and can be related. You can also see scenarios where they're non-related. And I've watched non-related breeding herds chasing each other around dams and having quite a fight. Yes, I think there's more than 30 elephants here. Look at them all coming up. This is absolutely stunning so and that female that's walking up the road straight up the road is heavy 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 pregnant so luke look what we're seeing now do you see the structure of these elephants how they're coming up in sort of a v formation the little ones are in the middle that's one way that they keep predators away from the little one that trunk yes that trunk is very strong their body structure is very strong they can they can get rid of a predator that way but mother nature is very smart and has made nothing invincible so just because the indlov sorry the elephants have this ability doesn't mean that they win all the time predators don't always win prey don't always get away this right now, if they keep coming up the road, is going to be really great. I just want to be quiet for a minute or two. I want to see if they'll come up nice and close to us. Absolute, absolute magic. So those Ellie's were three meters, about six foot from Jandre and I. And notice, did you notice when they came up, 
they stopped they smelled a little bit that one the youngster was very relaxed so he nursed from his mom and then they decided to carry on our winds coming a bit from behind us so they could smell us and hear us long long down the road but they're just checking that um, young elephant you heard just before they came up to the vehicle was in the herd breeding herd that's behind us that we we haven't viewed yet there their tummy rumbling and remember, just because we can hear those sounds doesn't mean that those sounds are the only ones they make. They're communicating the entire time through infrasound through their feet, which can travel up to 60 kilometers, six zero. Um, and and the, the ones that we hear is just, just a small subsector, you know, like whale song, and they, they catalog all that whale song. They're also busy doing it with elephants. So we get, asked every now and then um, about special moments and what's your special moments. Anytime elephants do this is a very special moment. And then Tristan has, an, again, another special moment with elephants, with that tiny little baby. So we'd like to send you back over to him so you can enjoy it as well. Very, very, very cool. It is the most coolest thing you could have ever possibly see and it's very cool now because we've got three different species in a row so you've got the waterbuck in front the impalas and then the alien and its baby and it gives you an idea of just how small this baby is it's unfortunately drifted a bit but you can see it's just over the back and it's smaller than that male impala so that'll give you an idea of just how little our baby elephant is it's still in a fairly open section so i'm going to still try and keep up with it a little bit so i'm just going to go around all the grazing animals because i don't want to disturb them either so we're just going to head around a little bit and just use this nice open clearing to be able to see her for a little bit longer as she kind of drifts the rest of the herd's tracks is going in this direction so i wouldn't be surprised that that herd that noel has might even be the herd for this female and her young one so maybe just maybe if noel stays with that herd these guys well these two might catch up towards the end of the afternoon and rejoin it would be something absolutely incredible if you can follow this female all the way until she rejoins with the herd because the greeting and the vocalizing and the talking that's going to happen between these ellies when they come together finally after being apart and this new addition to the herd is just going to be absolutely insane you'll find that they'll all come in they're all going to investigate this little one it's like a new baby in a human family everybody wants to come and say hello everybody wants to make a bit of a fuss about it and the same thing will happen with this little one so it's going to be so so interesting to follow and if we can try and get all the way to where that herd is it would be quite something now just going to try and just sneak in here to where it's shady because i think mom is going to stop in the shade again for a bit she seems to kind of cross through these sort of more open areas quite fast and then as soon as it gets shady she starts to relax again and starts to feed and i think she knows that the little one just can't move too far but look they're gonna come right past us now that's very cute Chitty Chatty Meg, how long does an elephant labor last? Longer than most women would like to hear, but 22 months is how long that she's pregnant for. And then her labor, well, her labor can be all the way through a night. Did you hear that? That is amazing. So she's talking, she's trying to probably contact the rest of the herd. Do you see, look, her ears are out. So she's using her ears, not only because they're big to try and control temperature, but also has satellite discs to be able to hear. So she's pushing those ears out. She's communicating like that, hoping that the rest of the herd communicates back to her. Those big ears trap all those sound waves, funnel it into the ear, and she can hear a lot better. So that is really absolutely incredible to hear and to see and so she stops now now she's going to start moving off she'll also have sensory cells in her feet and her trunk that would have picked up vibration from the low frequency sound that would have been produced if the rest of the herd responded and that way she'll then know and the way that she's now feeding i think she's content to know that the herd is maybe not too far away we might not have heard it but she might have picked up that okay they're somewhere close by it's within touching distance. I don't have to stress too much. I can still feed and stay in this area. Absolutely incredible. And that sound right there is one of my absolute favorite sounds in the whole bush. I love lions roaring. I love hearing a lot of the other animals, but that just sends these kind of goosebumps and I get my hairs down on end whenever I hear elephants making that sound. There's just something about it that is just unbelievable. And it's this loud, deep kind of grumble that comes out of their lungs absolutely phenomenal it really really makes me happy when i hear that and i was talking about their labor now their labor can last for quite some time you can imagine 
pushing out a you know almost 150 pound baby is not exactly that pleasant or 200 pound baby should i say is not exactly that pleasant and so it does take them in, in the experience that i've had and, and watch i've seen an elephant give birth which is probably one of the most amazing things that i've seen that the elephant that particular elephant was in labor for she must have been about three hours that she was in labor with the little one starting to her starting to dilate and starting to come out but it can go much longer than that i've, I've heard of elephants that are going into to start dilating around sunset and only the following morning is the little one birth, uh, born. So it does take some time and you can imagine how much distress this female must go through in order to have this little one. At the end of the day, like I said, it's not a small object and it's not a small baby. So she has to really kind of push it out and there's a lot of sort of trauma that happens and a lot of discomfort and and so it's a it's a very vocal process and it's a very kind of uncomfortable process and that's why the whole herd you'll find becomes a little bit stressed out during a birth of a little one but it is just the most special thing to watch that little one go where they're going now is starting to get too thick i don't want to hit trees and she's been so accommodating of us allowing us these be beautiful views of her little baby as it's walked past us so i think we're going to take our sort of leave and we're going to leave now and let her carry on with her afternoon hopefully this little one will join up with noel's herd or somewhere in that general vicinity i am going to meander down towards twin lambs and she has she is heading down that direction so maybe we get lucky with her coming out that side but i just really don't want to be bashing trees behind a little baby like i said we've been so fortunate with the way mom has treated us already let's not overstay our welcome and cause any undue stress in an already kind of hot afternoon paula you're wondering how much sleep an elephant needs well you know, it's dependent on how old they are. The little babies tend to sleep a lot more than the adults. Um, most elephants will only sleep for sort of four or five hours a day maximum. Um, and that's broken up into short little shifts of 10 to 15 minutes of sleep throughout the day. You'll find that they'll kind of go and they'll put their head up in the case of a big adult male up against a tree or lie down on a termite mound or on the kind of bank of a river and they'll sort of have a little 15 10 15 maybe even 20 minute nap in those areas particularly on a hot day like today and you'll find that they'll have a situation where they'll kind of enjoy that and then they move off again and then later in the day again and again and again and they repeat this process so they don't actually sleep too much and not long stints of sleep at the problem with them and why they can't sleep for long stints is because they have a situation where they need to feed a lot more there's a big bulk they need to process all this food and so they have a situation where they do need to feed constantly and sleeping for six seven hours like we do as people means that they don't really have the chance so just saying hello to tax so he's going to try and just quickly loop around and see if he can get a glimpse of it you can imagine imagine being here for your first time in africa you've just arrived and you get to see that as one of your first sightings absolutely amazing so those people are in for an absolute treat and are about to be very spoiled by a tiny little cute baby and also with a baby elephant like that if taxis are joining it doesn't make sense to pressure her with two vehicles we'll rather just let one vehicle follow her around and enjoy right senzo you ready for your time lapse no, you're not ready. But Senzo, everyone wants to see what you're wearing today because now Senzo is just shaking his head at me. He says, no, he doesn't want to be seen today. So because Senzo doesn't want to be seen today, we have somebody else who is up and moving and mobile, much like our elephant mom. And that is Scotty D. And hopefully he doesn't have a little baby following him around because that will, will just be a little awkward. But let's see where he's off to and what he's up to and whether or not he's got any plans for the rest of the afternoon. Hello, welcome back. Happy to hear you've been enjoying the elephants, I think, with Tristan, I think. <laughs> we have been putting the flaps up and down. Most recently they have gone up. So it's preventing us from making as much, covering as much ground as we would like. Bit of slow going. There's a whole bunch of water buck up ahead of us that are looking very, very intently. That's something. Who knows what it could be? Even there's a topi close to us that's just let off one or two snorts. So I'm going to use my binocular machine to scan ahead of where they're looking. Interesting, even the crown cranes are alarm calling. Wow! Wow! What is it that's getting them worked up? 
Okay, well, we're going to try and work out what is causing the commotion here. And while we do that, we are going to send you to a herd of elephants who are approaching a waterhole. Welcome back, everybody. So we were talking about how many elephants we were seeing. So this isn't everything. The herd that drank before and came up past the vehicle has carried on. But now you can actually see the sheer numbers that we're talking about minus about 12. And how stunning is this? And again, look, ad adult females, we did this yesterday as well. We had that small herd that came down to um, Juma Dam. Now we're at Chitwa Dam, but big female in front, all the youngsters in the middle, and then some of the adults taking up the rear as well. <clears throat> Absolutely stunning. Jim, they're, they're chasing the water buck away on the, the right hand side. The, the big female's going down and she's gonna go to the exact spot where those water buck were because then she knows that's clean water. She's like, get out, go away. Elephants are bullies. Big elephants pick on little elephants, so little elephants then pick on anything smaller than them and they definitely want their, their resources to themselves. They don't want to share their resources at all. I quickly want to pan over to the left. We have two young bulls who are busy swimming near the hippos just over here. We talked about it about 10 minutes ago, how elephants love to swim and it's a really warm day and there they are dunking each other, pushing each other around, really getting under. They roll all the way over. Sometimes it's just their little trunks that you see. <laughs> and again, just like humans, I remember as a kid swimming in the lakes and roughhousing with my brothers and sisters and our cousins, dunking each other, throwing each other in the air. I wouldn't say elephants throw each other in the air, but you, they have similar, similar patterns as we do. Watch, watch, watch. And there's a hippo gaping just in front of them basically showing his annoyance at those two males. They really couldn't care less. <laughs> so again, just like as I know today, if there weren't crocodiles in here, I would be swimming and jumping in this water as well. It's very, very warm. The wind's actually taking away a bit of the bite of the heat at the moment. But for them, that's a big animal. It's a lot of surface area to have to heat and to cool. And on a day like this, cooling it down takes swimming in, in the dam to, to really get the body uh, core temperature down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm viewers, I'm also loving this. Absolutely loving this. <clears throat> David, you're wondering if crocodiles will try with a young elephant. Crocodiles will try with anything that comes into the water. So what you'll see with crocs, uh, with specifically with elephants, is they're gonna go for the trunk. So when an elephant goes down to drink or, or anything, say an impala, that ripple, that, that, that uh, disturbance of the texture of the water, a crocodile can sense that up to about 100 meters. <clears throat> so they'll come, I've, I've encountered several elephants missing parts of trunks that a crocodile got. I've encountered small ones. I've also encountered adults with that. Um, now a young one swimming many, 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 many years ago, I was at uh, a reserve and we were watching huge herds of elephants come down to the really large water hole and there was a teeny tiny baby that was swimming. It was really interesting. The matriarch and the second in command were busy fending off crocodiles. They were chasing them away that was trying to come and get this tiny baby elephant uh, similar in size to the, probably to the one that Tristan's been seeing. Uh, so they were actively guarding because they knew it was going to be harder for that size crocodile to get to them in, in any way.
but the, the amount, even though the amount of splashing that these two males in particular are creating for a crocodile uh, look is really different. I know we've been doing some really amazing segments up in the Mara where <clears throat> the thrashing of the other crocs, uh, getting something like a wildebeest is attracting more uh, more crocodiles, but here because our crocodile numbers are lower, something like this isn't necessarily going to attract them to, for, for eating. They might get curious and come up and look, but one croc, especially the size of that female that we have been seeing here with Tristan with the babies, is not going to, she's not going to be able to do much with, with these two in the water like this. Welcome Facebook viewers, welcome to Safari Live. We have some bull elephants busy swimming and playing in the water. It's a very hot day. Again, we are live, this is interactive. You can ask us questions, send them through. <laughs> that one's decided that he's had enough, he's just gonna drink some water. And the, 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 uh, the other one's like, please play with me, please play with me. So we've been discussing how elephants cool themselves down and how they, on a hot day like today, it um, it is necessary for the core body temperature for them to, to really get into the water. Now, we really don't have um, much... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> much in the way of, of understanding how playful they are from a human perspective we can really put it in terms of us and I haven't seen anything that's changed my mind without anthropomorphizing too much they do they have fun so not only are they cooling their core body temperature down but they're really they're just having fun and especially when it's young males like this they don't they don't have a care in the world and he goes under again you saw his little feet kick up there there's his trunk. The other one's going to jump on him and push him down a little bit. Cat Mama, you're asking if Ellie's can use their trunk as a snorkel. Great question. They can. So you'll see a lot of the times, especially when they're going, he just did it now, when they're going under the water like that, um, they're just taking a breath, going down, and then if they stay down too long, they'll stick up their trunk. Um, I've also seen with river crossings in different parts of Africa with elephants um, going across the water, especially the little ones, they stick their little trunk up like that to, to catch air. Yeah, Richie, I would also say one of my favorite sightings. This is a type of sighting, no matter how many times you see it, it's always different, it's always fun. It never gets old, you just want to sit here the whole time. You almost want to join them. Although you'd probably be smushed, to be honest with you. Nick, I think you're asking how much water they need to drink every day. Uh, oh, how long they'll stay in the water, excuse me, Nick. How long they'll stay in the water each and every day. Look, Nick, sometimes they swim in the day. I've seen elephants swim three times in a day, depending on the heat, and sometimes they don't swim at all. Uh, sometimes they uh, just come and drink and then carry on. Sometimes they'll come... <laughs> Sometimes they'll come, drink, play in the mud, and also swim. Every day is different. It's very similar to us. You might, for instance, have a shower one day that lasts a half an hour, or one day you might just have a very quick, or you might have a bath one day. Every day you're gonna you're gonna change change it up, and for them as well. There's the little snorkel we were talking about. <laughs> Part of what's happening now is not only are they playing, 
but there's a little bit of dominant submissive behavior that's going on. So uh, female members of species will do this, but male members of species do this often, especially when they're growing up and when they have their testosterone's really starting to kick in, they'll mount each other. The, the one that's trying to show the dominance will mount the one they're trying to get to be submissive. Um, so so the, the smaller of the two is taking advantage of the fact that the, the bigger one is getting under the water and he's doing a bit of mounting. Uh, the bigger one's not really having much of that. He's, he's asserting himself fine. So there, there's play, definitely, as we talked about, but there, there's a bit of a funny little undertone. And remember as well, this play that we're watching is also play that will serve them when they're adults, when they get older. Um, they're building up muscles that they need when they're big male elephants and also learning how to sort themselves out in a, not, I guess you could say hierarchy. Um, male elephants aren't always together, but they are sometimes together. So sometimes they'll fight to the death when they're older and sometimes they just need a little whack here and there to, to sort out who's who at the water hole. Our breeding herd has moved away. I just want to pull forward a little bit onto the other side of the dam wall. I think we're going to have to wait just a little while to do that. The light's still good. I just don't want to get um, what Chitwa Chitwa has been amazing and, and lets us come and, and uh, view at their dam. But we've also got some of their guests that are on the other side of the of the dam wall and I just don't want to get in their way but the elephants are moving again so we should be fine. So Richie, I think you're asking if uh, other elephants come down, will they also join in? Oh! <laughs> Oh, will the hippopotamus join in, Richie? So those hippos are super annoyed that those elephants are there. They are not happy about the situation. They've clustered together. There was a little bit of gaping earlier to explain that they're not happy. I've actually seen male hippo, very territorial male hippo, when elephants come and sit, and sit like this, grunt, they do that hippo noise that I, I don't imitate very well, and sort of thrash around, and I've watched a male elephant just throw water at them. They, they, don't, they don't like each other overtly much. It's, it's not... They're, they're annoyed more than anything. Oh, swim time is over. I once had a question about color of elephants and and um, we saw dark elephants like this as opposed to the lighter one. And again, it's just the change in color from the water. So Facebook viewers, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful action of swimming elephants. I know that we enjoyed it very much, as you could tell by the giggling and the laughing. You guys must have a great day. Hi. Okay. And they're off. They're gone. They're going to go follow. The breeding herd has moved away. I don't know if we can focus down there at the, the inflow of the dam, but they've gone. They don't want to swim. They're over it. They had their drink. They're carrying on. And these males have had their fun and they've also realized that all the females have gone away. So they're not really part of the breeding herds anymore. They've been kicked out. They're kicked out usually around 15 to 18, right around in there. Um, so look, the smaller of the two might still be connected, but honestly, they're, they're at that point where they need to be on their own. That separation period is not quick. It takes a while and it can be a bit um, uh, traumatic to say, to say the least. So they'll follow closely behind, but not too closely behind to, to bother the herd, but just, just enough where they still feel like they have other elephants around. And then eventually they'll get old enough where they won't need the breeding herd unless they feel like mating or unless there's very small uh, water sources and they all have to share. All right, we're gonna head back towards Tristan, also with elephants. We're just having an elephant afternoon. I know he had that cute, cute, cute little baby earlier and let's see what he has in store for us now. 
Well, now I've got a very big, very large bull elephant. So what that little baby will be in 30, 40 years' time will be this massive, gentle giant that we have here. And it really is, like Noel says, an elephant-filled, elephant-fantastic afternoon. It is absolutely amazing. From no elephants to elephants everywhere, it's the best thing. I love having Ellie's back on the area. They are the one of the most entertaining, incredible creatures, and Noel's been absolutely spoilt that on her first kind of afternoon on Chitwa, she's had the Ellie swimming at the dam, so she's really been spoilt for that. It's one of my favorite things to watch at Chitwa Dam, is the Ellie swimming, and so I'm so glad that she got to see that. It's very cool. Now, this big boy has just had a little drink at Twin Dams. He's having a little kind of slow walk around now, and is feeding on various plants and various vegetation that is around here. After drinking, you often find this from elephants is that they will immediately start feeding. If you look at him though, even though he's drank here at Treehouse Dam, I mean Twin Dams, I thought he might have a little swim, but he's swam somewhere already. His skin is crusted with mud at the moment. He's had a really good bathe wherever he's been, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was maybe at Baboon Pan or just south of us where he had a really good wallow and has sorted things himself out and cooled himself down from there. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to change direction slightly because Senzo's got a big tree that he's going to walk into, and so I just want to try and reposition myself slightly so that Senzo has got a better angle on all of this. Gary, I've never seen an elephant develop skin problems if they don't get to swim. What they can get though is that they can get serious problems with their ears if they don't constantly use mud. So as babies, they can actually get severely sunburnt. It's the reason why they need to be under their moms and, and get their ears and things used to the sun. If you go and you see a little baby, like the one we saw this afternoon, it was a bit difficult because it was covered in water and mud. But that little baby has very, very pink, very sensitive ears and it takes a bit of time to get used to this harsh African heat. And so they pack it with mud and that will keep it all kind of healthy. But in terms of the actual skin itself, all that's going to happen is that they're going to be very dehydrated if they don't constantly spray water on them. Their skin is very absorbent and, and it's very porous and it will actually absorb moisture into the skin. And that's why when you find an elephant throwing water on itself, if you look on his head area and various other parts, there's little darker sections, that's where water has gone onto his head and is actually being soaked in by that skin. It's not running off like it does on our skin where it kind of just runs off and it goes. With an elephant, it actually soaks in and will become part of hydrating that skin mass. And, and all those folds that you see there are not because the skin is dry and cracked, that's all to increase surface area and to help with the transpiring of heat and to get heat out. The bigger the surface area of the skin, the more pores they are, the more they're able to deal with the African heat. So it's a very clever way of doing things. Now I'm pretty sure he's going to just feed his way along towards us here. What I might do is just back up slightly, depending on which direction he goes. He might go behind me, but if he comes in front, just because there's not very much space here, I might just move out the way of him a little bit. But for now it looks as though he might kind of go behind us. But he is such a gentle individual. We were down at the dam with him when he was drinking and he came walking past us. Not a single fluff of the ears, not a single sort of kind of lift of his head, nothing like that. He literally came past, investigated us by putting his trunk up, smelled, smelt a little bit, and then meandered off and started feeding. So he's one of those individuals that you sometimes get here. We are fortunate in the Kruger that we get a lot of elephants that are incredibly relaxed due to the fact that there's very little poaching pressure, and he's one of those individuals. These bulls are just some of the best bulls to spend time around. Now, Sorry, Kirst, if you can just repeat that, I didn't quite get the question. Ah, sorry, Paula, there we go. So I heard can elephants, but I didn't get the rest, but you said climb things. So elephants, not really, no. So they're not animals that are able to jump, and, and most climbing takes some sort of force of jumping to get up. I have seen elephants climbing over things, which is kind of using their feet to go over barriers and, and, and logs and those kind of things, and then climbing over it like that, but not actually climbing up things. So you'll never find an elephant up in a tree or walking over a tree. You will find them going up quite steep banks, though. I have seen them climbing up very steep banks and up mountainsides and hills. In fact, elephants have even been seen on the slopes of Kilimanjaro, which is 
is one of the high, well is the highest mountain in Africa and so you will find them going up onto those slopes there so they can climb quite steep gradients but definitely cannot climb trees or even logs or fallen over trees at the end of the day they weigh such a lot that there's not many trees that can support their weight so it seems like a futile idea in order for them to climb also they're incredibly tall animals so they've got a great field of view already and they've got a, an ability to cool themselves down so climbing into a tree is not really necessary from that point of view and there's very little that hunts them out here so they don't need to go up into trees for protection or to be able to try and defend themselves so ultimately there's no real reason for them to climb at the end of the day they can rock onto their back legs if they can't reach branches that they want also their trunk is able to extend a lot more than what we see it when they're at a relaxed position and they can reach branches and leaves and all kinds of other things above their heads and be able to pull that down and get to it so a real no real reason for an Ellie to be able to climb anywhere but he's slowly but surely absolutely dismantling an acacia that is behind this tree that we're seeing so it's difficult to see what he's actually eating but it looks like a small knob thorn that might be behind there that is being destroyed at this point now I was hoping that he might move and I'm worried that if I reverse he will move this way so I'm just going to be patient I'm pretty sure once he's destroyed that knob thorn he'll move to this knob thorn closest to us Romits, you're wondering if elephants consume poisonous plants. Well, they do have an ability to eat things that us as humans would consider poisonous. Um, some anim a lot of animals can. So if you think of something like a tamburti um, that Noel maybe showed you this morning. I don't know if you guys were watching, but Noel did discuss a tamburti this morning. And tambertis are, are plants that for us as people are highly toxic. We can't eat that, but yet kudu, giraffe, impalas, nyala elephants they're able to deal with that and be able to consume it and, and it's probably because also the increased amount of blood in an animal like an elephant remember an elephant has got over 350 liters of blood if you look at a big bull like this and so he's going to be able to digest and, and synthesize those protein or those toxins a lot better than what we would as people so yes they can feed off certain poisonous plants but for the most part they actually eat pretty similar to what we would they, there's a few plants that they can tolerate but most of what they eat is not toxic to us I mean things like a knob thorn leaf or a um, buffalo thorn or the figs the marulas I mean these are all things that we can consume even torchwood fruits all of those things are, are stuff that we also eat and so pretty much there's not too many plants Plants, but the ones that they do eat that are fairly toxic are, are plants that are helping to clean out their digestive tract and it acts basically as a natural sort of laxative to them it just kind of gets rid of stuff that they're battling to digest you see it like I say you see it in a lot of the animals they'll constantly feed off those tambuertis to try and just do that at certain times of the year Right, well, our Ellie is having a really good feed on his knobthorn. I think he might be there for a little bit of time, but ultimately this knobthorn will be impressive in that it will release tannins, which will make those leaves a little bit bitter, and he will then move off a little bit later. But while he's feeding and just taking it very easy and giving us a little eye over the top of the bush, I believe Noel is sitting at Chitwood Dam in the beautiful view of the hippos that are lurking in the water. So we have hippo, but then as we're sitting here with the hippo, while you guys were with Tristan and his wonderful elephants, we found a sandpiper. And I got super, super, I'm still excited about the sandpiper, but I got super excited because I thought it was a, um, a green sandpiper for a second, but it is in fact a wood sandpiper. You'll notice that white eye. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Thank you for posing for us. That white stripe over the eye. So I have not seen a green sandpiper this year, and we are coming to a close on 2017. I need to see that green sandpiper. Tick it off for my bird list for the year. I'm only at 300 birds for the year and I really want to push that up closer to 400 in the next couple of months. You can see probing down in there, trying to get it little bits of little insects and also notice the yellow color to the legs. And then if you want to see what I was looking for before, so <clears throat> we've got the wood sandpiper that's here, okay. There's the eyebrow stripe stripes on the on the chest there's no white on the shoulder so it can't be a common and then the green is down here notice that the stripe stops at the eye there it's similar patterns on the wing this one's also just a titch shorter so I'm gonna keep looking for my green there's the common just here and you can see that little bit of white on the shoulder and a little bit more white on the eye beautiful all right now I know you all love the baby baby hippos so we have hippos and there are some babies along with the adults. Got a little bit of a gape. 
So just for you viewers, baby hippos. Now because of the wind, they're not coming up as much as normal, but to the right of that dead leadwood tree, there's a baby that's resting on a mum. Now I've seen three babies so far just now. Two of them look super tiny <clears throat> and one a little bit older. But because they're not showing themselves enough, I can't tell you whether or not this is the baby hippo that you found with Tristan on, I almost said on New Year's Eve, but what I mean is Halloween. But it is very common for them to sit, <laughs> to sit on their mom's backs like this. Um, hippos don't necessarily swim. They walk and bounce on the bottom of the water. Although that being said, when I was just up in South Luanga National Park in Zambia, we were talking about a flood that happened in 2007, I want to say, and it was a hectic flood. Um, all of the all of the camps, the village of Mfuyu was all underwater. And a guide that I was working up with just now, who was also a guide at that point, said he actually saw hippos swimming in that current. So I think there's a lot that we don't know about these creatures. I think because they do X, Y, and Z 99.9% .9 of the time, when it does come to something odd, like them swimming in a current, in a, in a flood, um, we don't have as much information. Because I don't know what researcher is going to go out into a river, a croc-infested river, in the middle of a flood and do some hippo research. If we, oh you're already there, Jandre, you totally read my mind. There's two of the little babies I was talking about now, so other than that small one, having a little play date, sniffing each other, roughly the same age. So hippos mate underwater, they nurse underwater, and they give birth underwater. They're, they're almost fully aquatic, because they just come out for eating, as we know. Riti, you're asking if hippo babies are attacked by predators, and yes, 100%, they definitely are. Um, I've seen spotted hyena take out uh, hippo babies. I've seen crocodiles try and take out hippo babies. I have seen male hippos kill and eat hippo babies. Um, so that's not predation, but there's this <laughs> definite aggressive display there. Um, I've seen leopard try for hippo babies. Oh, we saw it with Tristan the other night. Um, I believe it was Hassana, but I can stand corrected on that. You all would know better than I would trying for that hippo baby definitely happens. Yeah, so that was Asana. Um, lions will try, but I've also seen spotted hyena take down a larger hippo. I've seen lions take down larger hippo. Um, I've seen elephants try and tusk a large hippo. They had a little bit of a spat on, on land. I've actually seen an elephant kill a rhino, now that I'm thinking about that, tusking it, uh, fighting over a food source on a really dry, dry, um, dry uh, winter season. So yeah, so it's, it's not just predators, it's also other herbivores and aggressive displays that, that will interact with each other and, and hippo for sure. But I've also seen hippo, um, actually when I worked up in the Mara, I've seen hippo chasing crocodiles away from uh, prey they're trying to catch. And then I've also seen a hippo steal uh, a zebra foal that a crocodile had caught and then eat it for himself. There's a lot of, of crazy, crazy things you see out here. So it's not just the hippo babies. I know I went on a tangent there. It's not just the hippo babies, but also hippo adults that, that can be preyed upon. Um, and then the interactions between their own species and different species that we would normally think might be docile or not interactive or combative because they're herbivores. It still, uh, still amounts to, to some um, interesting scenarios. Snazzy, you're wondering what happens if hippos can't touch the bottom of the dam. So where they're lying right now, they can touch. That's how they're they're resting. If they can't, oh, sorry, just listen. Um, what they'll do is they'll just walk on the bottom, and then when they need a breath, they push up in the Okavanga Delta. The, when the floodwaters come down from the rains in Angola on the mountains there and they come and they, they flood that, um, that giant uh, uh, marsh, the floodplain, um, the hippos are the ones that, that help build the pathways between the islands that the boats use to traverse from island to island. And that's by walking and running along, along the bottom. They also kick up the silt and and mix the mix the nutrients so scotty d whose birthday was yesterday um and who seems to be out and about in a fixed vehicle 
is up in the Mara and has a wonderful bird to show us. So we are going to head up north and see what we can see up there. Wonderful stuff. Sounds like you've been having a great time with both Noel and Tristan. We have found an ostrich. And I'm wondering to myself if he's been lucky enough to find any girlfriends. It's that time of the year for ostriches. They are beginning to nest. And maybe what's happening is that he's left the female to incubate the nest while he gets some food because it's the men that do the incubation at night and the females during the day. So maybe that's what's going on or maybe he's just not lucky enough to get himself or to have got himself a girlfriend or two this summer. They're such bizarre birds. I was actually just doing some research and they interestingly have the largest egg of all birds but it's the smallest relative to their body size or one of the smallest relative to their body size. So chickens and most other birds I guess will lay larger eggs comparative to their body size than an ostrich. Which I find quite interesting. Looks like it may have spotted something there. Let's give it a moment or two. I'm told they have very, very good eyesight. Oh, Philip, that's terrible news. You haven't seen any female ostriches on our drives yet. <clears throat> We have seen quite a number, and quite often they are actually together. More often than not, you'll see a male and several females together, his harem of ladies. And there's actually a large flock of about 12 ladies that hang out on the other side of the river that I've been lucky enough to see on a number of occasions. So be patient, and I'm sure you'll get to see a female soon. They are quite drab compared to the males. They have a uniform grey feathering, unlike the males, black and white. So, maybe even this afternoon we might be able to find you some, or maybe his girlfriend, if he does have one, will poke her head up. It would be so, so wonderful to be able to find an ostrich nest and monitor it, because to see tiny little Ostrich chicks would be extremely, extremely cute. Hello, I didn't do it. You'd like to know if ostriches molt their feathers. And yes, they, they will, but I, I don't think they're going to have a full feather molt. I think it's just more of an ongoing process, as opposed to some animals that will have molts between seasons. One of the birds I can think of that does a full feather molt is the female hornbills that often nest in cavities and trees and while they're in there incubating the eggs they go through a full feather molt but I'm guessing that's not going to be able to be possible for ostriches because they don't nest in cavities and they'd be running around in the nude so I think it's more of a, just a gradual ongoing process which I'd guess is the same for most birds actually Well, thankfully we've been dry for quite some time now, and let's hope it stays that way. There is still a little bit of rain in the area, but whether it comes towards us or misses us, only time will tell. I just heard a strange noise. I don't know what it was. Did you hear that mono like a <laughs> It was Manu's stomach. <laughs> That's hilarious. I thought we were in for some kind of an action. But alas, no. Thanks for owning up. Do you know that the word for there's an actual word for when you're 
stomach makes a rumbling noise, and it's called borborygmy, or borborygmous action. You can use either. Funky word you developed just to describe stomach noises. Thanks, Dad, for teaching me that. Wonderful. We're going to head off. I'm getting close to my toothpaste uh, deal that I'm going to try and hustle at Serena at one of the staff camps, running low on toothpaste. So I'm going to go and do that and send you off to Noel with a crocodilian. Thank you, Scotty D. I hope your ostrich was amazing. All right, we were talking about crocs and do crocs like hippos. This croc is not going after any hippos, but this croc is doing something very, very interesting. And I wonder if maybe some of our viewers who have been watching for a long time, or maybe some of our new viewers have any idea what's up. Send your comments on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live, or on YouTube chat. I'll be interested to see if you know what's potting here. And then let's just wrap a little bit about crocodiles. Crocodiles are super interesting. So something that's uh, to be aware with crocs is it takes them many years to get large. And I know Scott was talking about <clears throat> um, digestion with ostrich. So crocodiles also do something interesting where they swallow stones to help digest the meats that they're, they're eating because they can't chew, they swallow whole pieces. Those stones in traditional culture in many African countries are considered to have really strong muti, which is magic or medicine. Um, and so a lot of very large crocodiles are killed for those special stones. There's other parts of their body they use as well to be used in traditional medicine. So with a large croc that can live 100, 150 years, taking those genes out of the gene pool is, is can be uh, uh, tricky for the for the ecosystem and also large crocs play a very important role so this croc that we're looking at is a big croc but, but is by no means an extremely large crocodile the crocs that uh, we're seeing up in the mar are going to be twice the size of this croc here lengthwise and and width is also going to going to be a lot larger um so the smaller the croc, the smaller the prey it eats. The larger the croc, the larger the prey it eats. So they're feeding different um, feeding habits within the same ecosystem. So you can have really large crocs that are in with very small crocs and they don't have to necessarily um, combat each other for, for a food source. Um, it's called food partitioning. Uh, it's just a little side note, your interesting fact for the day. Well, I hope you get more than one interesting fact today uh, with the three of us out and about showing us, showing you what, what we can see. Lara, you say the croc is soaking up the sun. Indeed, indeed, that is part of what this crocodile is doing. So they are ectothermic. The correct term is poikilothermic. So they need outside heat to regulate their temperature. So they, if they are cold and they want to get warm, they have to move either upside or along something warm like a rock that's been in the sun or lay in the sun. And if they want to cool down, then they need to submerge their body into something that is cooler and that's how they regulate their temperature. So that's part of what this crocodile is doing. But what I really want everyone to notice, and as we pan back around, um, you're going to notice that the mouth is open. So another way for the crocodile to either warm up or cool down is to open its mouth and there's a little flat that you're seeing called a guler flap okay so basically this crocodile is too hot it's facing away from the Sun opening its mouth to release heat if it was cold it would be facing towards the Sun to I want to say ingest heat I ingest not the right word but for all better purposes right now that is what she's up to and I say she not because it's super easy to say if this is male or female although the females tend to be larger in size um, but we've been having great sightings with Tristan with that female with the little hatchlings that are on the other side of the dam and so I am making an assumption that this is her although it could be a different croc. Oh Shane the little baby hippos are playing at the the bottom of the the dead leadwood tree side note. A lot of their communication is under the water Again, similar to whales. So whales and hippos, as you, as you guys know, I know Steph talked about this a few weeks ago, um, are, are in the same order. They're in the order Whipomorphia. <laughs> a lot of the behaviors are similar. Oh, shame. And again, being playful. So playful and also learning to use their skills and to hone their muscles from when they're adults 
and they need it for non-playful situations, for more dire situations. Had an interesting scenario this afternoon where we had lots of elephants come and drink. Um, the elephants were swimming, the hippos were here, the crocs over there, and everything is within its its little niche and not interacting adversely, but just sort of occupying its own its own little space. Had a very calm afternoon. There's good vibes today. Okay, we're gonna carry on over the dam wall. Um, Hasana has gone south into little gallery. I'm not sure if Tristan updated you. And the male lion that we were looking for this morning on foot has gone north into Biffleshook. So we're gonna see if we can go find our own cat. Jandre and I were chatting about wanting to see wild dogs. That would be fantastic. So Tristan's driving around. Let's see what he has in store for us. I am driving around. I am absolutely loving my afternoon, just bumbling in this beautiful conditions. It really is such a wonderful afternoon. Conditions are perfect for an afternoon safari, especially now the temperature is really getting to that optimal kind of temperature for animals to start moving around. So we're still around Twin Dams. I've had lots of grey go-away birds calling, lots of squirrels alarm calling. Can't find any tracks for Asana coming back north just yet but I'm looking around just in case he did head in this direction so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just kind of loop and go up a bit and then come down the Mulawati back towards Twin Dams because I have this funny feeling that Hosanna is here but with that bull elephant drinking might have just gone and lay in some shade in a little thicket where I can't see him just yet and then with the Sun kind of going down he might meander towards Twin Dams itself and we'll get him around sunset so that's the plan at least hopefully it will be a successful plan I think it will be there's enough birds and, and animals and things alarm calling that he could be in that vicinity also we know this morning that he wasn't too far south of the boundary he was kind of flirting with the edge and he was going up and down and he did go north and south and so it's going to be interesting maybe he's gone further south I don't know the guys in the south say to me they can't find any sign of him and so I'm not 100% sure whether he has crossed north I certainly haven't found any tracks though that would indicate he is on our side but it may be this afternoon he will come over towards twin dams and we'll find him on that damn wall just at that perfect time and I would say an hour's time that's what I'm going to call it in one hour we're going to have Hosanna somewhere around Twin Dams. It's a big call but a call that I feel like we should make nonetheless. Pokemon guy, yes we have seen a chameleon on Juma. I saw one about a week ago, um, actually not very far from where I am right now, just on the other side of this drainage line. So there has been one scene this summer already. I know Byron had a winter chameleon which was very cool and so I would imagine that maybe just maybe more of them will come out. Heat like what we're having now will definitely be a driving force for chameleons to come out. Now two of my favorite birds of prey are actually sitting perfectly placed on a beautiful dead tree. In fact three of them which is quite nice so I'm going to stop fairly shortly because I'm hoping these guys who are generally fairly relaxed with us will actually stay where they are because the light is beautiful on these three at the moment and they are sitting right out in the open it's really a beautiful sighting and they are the three battalier eagles that we get in this area they nest not too far away from where we are in fact just behind me a little bit and they'll often see them perched on these dead trees in this section or gliding through the air with that beautiful white and black wing that they've got but when they are perched is really when they come into their own you can see they've got this beautiful red face and there's jet black wings with a bit of gray and, and rusty red on the back and then those red legs they are wonderfully pretty carnivores and, and, and they are some of the most incredible raptors that we have out here now it is a male and a female that is sitting there male closest to us female at the back um, and so we can tell that because of the wings it's difficult for you guys to see the female at the back there but I will be able to show you in the book just now and then the one off to the left I can't see very nicely but it looks like the male on the back there as well so it looks like a second male now that could be offspring from this individual I highly doubt it is a mating sort of situation where another male is there because it's all far too tolerant and these three are seen together so often 
that it must be a chick. The interesting thing about that though is that that chick is already fully fledged and is in its adult plumage which takes seven years to get there so I'm surprised that the breeding pair is tolerant of that individual and that there isn't more competition over it. I wonder if maybe it's going to get chased out fairly soon and be pushed off on its own but it definitely looks like another male that is sitting there and, and everything is fairly peaceful at this stage. Now to see one of these guys in a dead tree like this is special. To see two of them is even better and three well that's just fantastic particularly on an afternoon like this where we've got a lot of sort of thermals that will be around I'm surprised that these three are not flying around and moving and actually getting themselves out and about searching for food. Richie, you're asking if all eagles have feathers on their legs. So all true eagles do. There are certain eagle species out here that don't. So the things like the snake eagles, which are not considered true eagles, they do not have feathers on their legs at all. They've been specifically designed in order to go after snakes. They've got hardened scales that allow them to be able to withstand certain envenomations by snakes when they catch them, and so some eagles don't. But if we look at the majority of our eagles, you will see, so here, I mean, I'll show you the battaliers, and, and you'll see that they've got feathers all the way down to their feet so the feathers come all the way in that direction you'll find that even the fish eagles and the osprey while which are above while their feathers don't go all the way to the feet they do go very low down now these sort of plates and, and drawings are not quite that accurate they do come down a little further than that and generally they are just the feet kind of sticking out now earlier I was saying to you that we can sex these battaliers just by them sitting now you'll see the male when he sits, he lacks any white on his wing at all. He's got this dark section, so he's got the light gray over the shoulder and then the dark black primaries that come down. Whereas a female, you see the white bar that runs over her wing that gives you an idea of what she looks like. When they're in flight, you'll then find that you can see the same thing in flight where the male, deep, long, broad black lines on his body and or on his wings and then little thin kind of pinstripe on the female's wing and that's why it shows so much more white when you see them sitting of course when they are born this is what they look like they are these kind of brown drab individuals that have no coloration and are saying that it takes them seven years to go from this juvenile into the subadult and from the subadult into the adult up above but it's an amazing transition from a brown eagle into that coloration there is just the most wonderful thing and like I say a long transition too so it must feel like forever for these battaliers to be able to come into adulthood. The nice thing about these three is that they are just so relaxed. I absolutely love them because you can drive right up near them and we get the most kind of intimate views of them. It's, it's an eagle that obviously is very pretty but sometimes can be a bit flighty. In a lot of places you'll drive up and they'll kind of just fly off and you won't actually get to see too much of them. So these three are actually really very pleasant because you can spend a long time with them and you can get really close to them. In fact, we could probably get closer than what we are now. I'm not because I wanted to see all three of them and I don't want any of them to fly away. And I also want them to continue to be relaxed. I don't want to in any way give them some sort of reason to stop sitting around for us at the end of the day. But one of my favorite eagles for sure, and like I was saying just now, I'm surprised that they're not up and moving at the moment. Maybe they have fed already today. Their crops don't look particularly full. Generally, you'll find if a battalion is fed, it gets this big swollen kind of crop section around the throat area which these guys don't have. So I'm surprised with the number of carnivores that we have around. Often there are dead animals and particularly in heat like this, you will sometimes find baby animals. So like these newborn impalas, there will be stillborn impalas around this area that these guys can then scavenge off and feed off. So it's an interesting thing to see all three sitting. Maybe it's because it's that time of the year that they are going to start trying to breed a little bit and that's why they're kind of down on the branch and there's maybe been some courting that's happened during the day. Joshua, raptors can be very territorial. Um, at the end of the day, nesting sites don't come easily. And so when you find a, a decent nesting area, then they can push each other off quite quickly. And so they are fiercely territorial around their nesting sites, certain species and other species not so much. You think of something like a white-backed vulture, they'll nest in colonies up on cliff faces, whereas these guys tend to nest only as a pair. Things like martial eagles, um, even most of the eagle species are pair nesters and they'll be territorial and fiercely protective of that area. The reason why they have to be like that is much like any other carnivore is that it's very difficult to compete for, for mating 
hunting rights if there's lots of you around it's difficult for food items there's only a finite amount of food as a predator or as a carnivore and so you can't have 40 bateliers all nesting in the trees all around each other because finding food and feeding those chicks is going to be very difficult and so that's why they're territorial and they keep everybody at bay but absolutely wonderful birds to see I'm gonna try and see if we can just maybe get a little bit closer the road goes past them so at the end of the day I've got to kind of carry on with the road but if we can maybe get a little closer we might be able to get that detail on their heads which is the best thing and especially if there's a bit of a breeze and they turn all their feathers push forward and they get this big rounded kind of crown it is absolutely beautiful when they get it so let's see maybe they're gonna stay looks like they are hey guys Oh no, there goes one. I didn't want it to go, but one is gone. So the male's gone, the female is now still there. You can see the white on her wing pattern. There we go. Look at that. Is that not beautiful? That is absolutely a wonderful view of a battalier. It doesn't get any better than that. You see that nicotating membrane on the eye as well every now and then there's that wind that i was talking about that fluffs their feathers unfortunately you get a situation where it's not quite the right direction i was hoping that if they faced us like that the wind would just catch the feathers and fluff it all up and they almost look like a chicken but there's that membrane that i was talking about going constantly over the eye i wonder if because there's a bit of a breeze and a lot of dust in the air that membrane is doing a lot of cleaning over the eye just to make sure that this bird doesn't get too much dust there and doesn't get any sort of infections in the eye because ultimately this is a bird that relies heavily on eyesight look at the size of its eye in relation to its head eyesight is a hugely important sense for a bird like this they generally fly quite low they spot carcasses and then they come down and feed off them so they need their eyes to be clean and working all the time but she's blinking quite excessively at the moment that is just so cool to see a view like this is just the best it's not very often we get to see these birds as close as this like I said they generally are a bit flighty the male wasn't too interested in having us this close but the female she seems fairly unperturbed by our presence at the moment and there's the other male there he's got adult coloration and adult plumage so I'm not sure what he's doing and whether or not the others are being tolerant for some reason but there's definitely no kind of aggression towards one another Philip, you're asking if they will produce a clutch every year if maturity takes so long. Well, as far as I know, they do produce a clutch every year. There's normally only a single egg that hatches out of it. I have seen sometimes two together on a nest. Um, it's not very common, but it's generally just a single egg. Um, but I'm, I, to be honest, not sure what the sort of length of them looking after the egg is. So I know that these battaliers and, and the battaliers that I've followed most of the time do clutch every single year. And the sub-adults and the, and the juveniles just kind of fly around within the area, but they're not really at the nest itself, and they'll look after the new ones. So it's an interesting thing I, I would love to know if the frequency between them changes according to density uh, or the frequency of clutching changes according to density or if there is some sort of reason for the frequency to become different um, as far as i know though they are like most of the birds of prey is that they will probably they clutch every sort of year year and a half in terms of their kind of egg laying process absolutely beautiful though the thing is when you see these guys on a tree like this sometimes people get very excited because they are scavengers and that there might be a predator around but in this case you would need to have evidence of other birds of prey so you would need tawny eagles coupled with some vultures and then you would know that there would be something dead here this is just literally because they're close to the nest the nest is like i say not too far behind us and so often see them on these dead trees around sort of ledwood drakensberg area constantly see them around this place so pretty cool right battalier eagles you guys have been very obliging i'm going to think i'm going to leave them where they are i don't want to like i say disturb them any further than we have already hopefully they're not going to fly as i try and just sneak past we're going to do it ever so quietly as much as we can now i didn't hear what Kurt said i just heard that we need to go across to scotty d who apparently bought something or other and i'm pretty sure whatever it is it will be a good story behind it and a lot of laughs because anything that scotty does generally encourages a chuckle and his chuckle is quite infectious so let's go across and see what it is some toothpaste but sadly they didn't have any fear not manu has kindly offered to lend me some of his and 
It's not the end of the world. I've still got a little bit. <laughs> We've just arrived down at the Mara River. And let's see what we can find down here. Hopefully some crocodiles, some hippos, maybe some birds, maybe a lion. Okay. Lots of hippopotamuses. Two of which are here. And a whole bunch further upstream. Yay, they're beginning to call, which is really nice. It's that stage of the evening. They've got a wonderful call. <coughs> That's my version of what they will hopefully continue to do for us. And they're all getting ready for a night out feeding. There's lots of food for them at the moment, so I don't think they have to move too far. Let's have a look further upstream. It looks to be like there's two youngsters playing around a bit, Manu. Let's hope they continue. A little bit to the left. They've both gone under. They're behind the two that we can see in the foreground of your shot. Now it's those two youngsters over there that are playing around. They're tiny and they're practicing fighting for future years where they may have some very serious fights. Hippo can be quite ferocious animals not only for us as humans but also amongst themselves fighting over a stretch of river that occupies a lot of ladies and often you see the males with very large lacerations all over their body from fights with other hippos they've got very interesting dentistry they've got two teeth that stick forward out the bottom of their jaw oh that one just a little salmon dive out the water Hello, aggressive dung beetle. What an interesting name you have. And you would like to know if a hippo would ever bite an elephant. And maybe, but they're far, far smaller than elephants, so they'd be taking on quite a big opponent if they decided to bite one. I'm sure it may have happened at some point, probably during a drought, where both the elephants and the hippo we're getting a bit possessive over a drying up puddle of water. But unless it's, you know, trying times like a drought, it's unlikely that hippos and elephants will have any issues with one another. What is more likely, though, and what does happen, aggressive dung beetle, is that it's quite common for hippo to actually attack antelope that run into water trying to escape from predators. And that's happened a number of times at the Arethusa waterhole where we used to traverse when I was back at Juma. We actually had a dam cam there. I can't remember if we actually got footage of it happening or if we just got reports from the Arethusa guides, but it is something that the hippos do from time to time. And I think it's possibly, Manu, let's go to the other ones. They're just jumping around the other two youngsters. Um, so I think it could just be through confusion and maybe a bit of excitement that they will kill antelope as they run into the water. On other occasions they can actually try and help them. So maybe that was just a rogue hippo that had a bit of an issue. Let's see if these youngsters keep playing. What they're doing is they're kicking off the ground and then porpoising out of the water. And that's typically how hippos get to move around in the water. Wherever you see them kind of with their heads poking out of the water, you know they're standing. But where these guys are playing around, it's a bit too deep. So they've had to push up off the ground now. And they'll sink back down.
Looks like there's a larger one there, possibly adjudicating this little bout. Happy to hear that a lot of you are loving this very soothing scene down at the river's edge with these hippos entertaining us. Usually during the hotter hours of the, or well, the middle hours of the day, not towards early morning and late evening, they can be quite docile in the water. So it's quite wonderful to see them playing around as they are. What would be really nice is if we saw them doing a mass exodus, because they really do have quite crazy bodies when you see them out the water. Hello Gremlins General, General, you would like to know if we still have the chance of seeing any river crossings of zebra, topi, wildebeest, Thompson's gazelle outside of the migration season and yes most certainly I know Darvi and Martin one of our cameramen and one of our tech wizards were coming out to do some work on I think some river cams and they saw a really cool zebra crossing and I think it's mainly the zebra that cross at this stage of the year but others could Manu let's go like right up above the rapids now there's a few more hippos that were really displaying quite well they're a little bit further away a little bit to the left there we go these guys have been opening their mouths and tossing water up into the air. Come on, do it again. Almost. If you just frame left a bit, there was another one to the left of him. If we can keep those two in frame, it's, it's those two, the one you were on and that one over there, that were displaying the most. Oh, is it going to do the rollover for us? There was one hippo. Where was it? Was it at Juma? Or was it before my time at Juma that used to kind of spin around, rolling in the water with its legs coming up out the water? And Kirsty, thanks. You think it was at Buffelzook Dam? I certainly remember a hippo that was almost renowned for doing this funny roll where you'd see its stumpy little legs poking out the water as it tumbled around. Was it signature move? Sadly, all these guys that were displaying have now calmed down. And because there is so much food around, they're going to be in no rush to leave the water. So, in dry periods, when there's not as much food, you'll often find hippos out the water even now, in the early evening and later into the morning where they've had to travel further for food. Seems like these initial ones are still the most playful out of all of the hippos in this pod. They've got tiny teeth. These are youngsters. I wouldn't be able to guess at how old they are, but big hippos have got far, far larger teeth. So just judging from that, you can tell that they're not fully grown. getting a bit more rain. You can also possibly hear some thunder rumbling. Huh. Hello Jerry, you'd like to know if I've got any stories of curious little hippos. And no, sadly I don't. I can think of nothing better. This is the wonderful noise I was hoping you'd be able to hear. Thank you, hippopotamus. No, I, I haven't spent too much time with tiny hippos. I've got no, no really, not many baby hippo stories at all. I guess it's probably because they're mainly 
in the water during the day and out at night when we're spending less time out. And as far as I can tell, or as far as I've noticed, they've been quite shy and not very inquisitive. Okay, good. Well, I think we're going to leave this wonderful scene and, and send you off to Tristan, who is going to impart some of his master tracking skills with you. Well, Scotty D, I don't know if master tracking skills is quite the right word for what I get up to. I feel like I just hack my way through some of the tracks and try and learn the ones that apply to what I need to know and what I need to do. But the tracks that we have here are very, very cool tracks and very interesting. These are not tracks that we see very, very often, and they look and can be a little bit on the deceiving side. So if we look at this track here over this side, it looks very much like... A leopard track in a way you've got the toes in the front you've got this kind of lobe at the back and it looks very similar the thing about this track is that it is very small so it would be a situation where you would think maybe leopard cub but there's no sign of a mother leopard anywhere around here no leopard cub of that size is going to be walking out and about by itself or lion cub for that matter so it's definitely not that and that only leaves a few different individuals now in terms of being able to tell what this individual is there's a few very key signs that tell us if we have a look at this one at the back here the first indicator of why this is not a leopard is very evident if you see here is the back of that front pad over there there is the toes in front but if you look here there is a very noticeable secondary pad that comes off the back of this track so it's a very round big lobe off the back then the next pad here and then if you count the toes one two three four five toes and again in the front this one will show you much better the toe count but there is a toe one over there two three four five now we know that the cats and even the hyena species and jackal species only have four toes so that only leaves us with two possible op options for this individual which is either a porcupine or a honey badger now noelle showed you porcupine tracks this morning she would have probably explained to you that this back pad area will be full of lots and lots of different segments and so if i show you in the book which i'm going to come and show you now when we get onto the car itself i can show you a little bit more in detail what i'm talking about but basically if we have a look over here this is the sorry since i'm going to move it so that the steering wheels are in the way you've got honey badger and porcupine on the right side of the page if you look at the porcupine this is what i was talking about it's got multi segments so lots of little segmented pads on its feet that you can see and then you can see the one two three four five toes with a very very small side toe also quite a big space between the toes you see a lot of space there and the top of the pad is very close to the toes itself if we come up to the honey badger which is what these tracks are you can see that big kind of pad at the bottom and then this pad that we see there toes that are on the side quite a big gap between the two it's also very triangular in shape and then these three toes very closely packed together which is exactly what we see in this track and then the claws way out in front i mean you can see how far the distance is between the claws and the pad itself and that's because they've got very long arch claws to dig and that's why they have such a long length so these are honey badger tracks which is very cool to see it's some of the best honey badger tracks i've seen in quite some time so it'd be nice if we had actually found the honey badger i'm sure these are from last night but still like i say very nice to see and the light on them was perfect to be able to show you guys and i know some of you keep a track book so i know that you guys add tracks that we've seen on drive to your books and, and kind of work out all the different tracks that we have and so hopefully that will be a new one for some of you right now the baby theme of the week continues because well we've had babies everywhere on this side of the world there's been a few in the Mara and it sounds like Scotty D has stumbled upon a tiny little baby maybe he should ask that one for a little bit of toothpaste got a wonderful scene here a young Thompson's gazelle nursing from its mother and it'll be interesting to see how long the mother allows it to nurse for as you can see the youngster still has quite a bit of work to do in order to be able to work that milk out and I'm hoping that once mom has had enough of that We'll get to see this youngster running around joyfully. I'm scanning around just making sure there's no jackals lurking around because there is a family of jackals that live in this area. And 
at this time of the year with lots of baby Tommies around, it's going to be probably the number one food choice for jackals because they can fairly easily catch and overpower these youngsters, although we did have an incredible sighting a few days ago of one of these youngsters escaping the wrath of a jackal, mainly thanks to the fact that its mother came back and chased the jackal away. It was an awesome, awesome scene. Come on, take us for a little run around, Tommy. Show us how quick you are. What it could alternatively do is just lie down in a thick patch of grass. That is how they spend the majority of their day when their mother leaves them, tucked away, hidden, and only comes back as and when they need to feed. They blend in incredibly well in very open areas. Let's see if it's going to find its sleeping spot here, or if it's going to hang around with Mom for a bit longer. Got a bit of an itchy jaw, it appears, having no trouble scratching it though. And it's just fascinating how these very, very young animals have got such great control over their body. Hello, Philip. <clears throat> you would like to know if Thompson's gazelles will flood the market, just like impalas will do with their babies and I'm not entirely sure I mean th I think naturally a, a lot of herbivores especially the antelope do give birth at similar times of the year but it depends on the area because even the impala up here I don't think they have as strict a rutting season as the impala down south and south in, in Juma so there will definitely be a, an abundance of youngsters around but possibly not as many in a short period as the impala. Here I've noticed impalas of varying sizes, and I guess it could be because the seasons are not as defined or as, as different as the ones in South Africa. It's kind of almost constantly there's a lot of food around here. Good question, though. It'll be something we'll have to monitor over the coming weeks and months as we get to explore not only Juma, but also here. I think this area is going to provide us a lot of new insights into the same species of animals that we see down in Juma, be it the lion, the hyena, the impala. Ah, oh, that's what I was hoping for. Come on, a bit more of that. One thing I don't quite understand about how Mother Nature planned the growth of youngsters is why their parents need to lick their bottom to help them defecate. Very, very strange that they need to do that on top of all the other things that they need to do whilst looking after their youngster. Very good. Well, I think we're going to press on, leave this little Tommy and its mom to their own devices. But Murphy's Law, as soon as I say that, the baby starts to play, <laughs> teasing us to stay. Hello Jennifer, you'd like to know if gazelles are the fastest of the antelope. And yes, they're definitely a very fast species, mainly because a lot of the gazelles are not very big. Be it the springbok, the Thompson's gazelle, the Grant's gazelle, there's a wide number of them that are very quick. But I think the hartebeest are, create the family or part of the family that have the fastest moving antelope in them. And I think there's actually some running around just in front of us. Let's have a look at them there. 
At kind of 11 o'clock, Manu, there's some running around. Perfect timing. Please continue to run. Looks like they're taking some of their youngsters for a little bit of an evening jog. They, too, just like the Tommies, have got a few youngsters. <laughs> so I think these guys are the fastest antelopes in the Mara at the moment, but I'm sure the Tommies are not too far behind them. Now, what isn't looking promising for the rest of our evening is there is a large bank of rain making its way towards us from the north. Still some pretty colours out there towards the west where the sun is setting. But I fear we are going to have a soggy latter half of the drive. Oof, and now the wind's picking up. It's quite chilly. So why don't we send you off to a brighter, sunnier, warmer environment with Noel? Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the Thompson's Gazelle. Thompson's Gazelle are always super interesting. We don't get gazelle down here in South Africa. We get other antelope species. Uh, the closest we have to a Tommy would be a springbok. Oh, oh my goodness, there's a tortoise. It's not mating. I really wanted to show you guys mating tortoises today. I don't know why, but there is a giant tortoise. It is a leopard tortoise. I just, do you see where I'm looking here? Three o'clock, just after the sand on the green little bit in front of that shrub directly. Ah, ha, ha. There we go. Leopard tortoise. So we had tortoise tracks this morning before we started walk. Um, I put them on my Instagram account as the track of the day, so if anyone wanted to know the answers to that, that, that was that. And what I want you to notice with this tortoise is the way that it is walking. So, and what's actually feeding right now, so it's not walking how I want to show you. It sort of uh, scuffs its feet a little bit and leaves these long marks that sort of connect into each other. So leopard tortoise, obviously because of the color of the shell. So something that's come up in my career time and time again is, do you have turtles here? Turtles, tortoises, terrapins, and calling all three of them turtle, turtle, turtle. So tortoises live on land and are vegetarians. Turtles live in the ocean and are selective feeders. And, tor and um, terrapins live in fresh water, like where we were watching the hippos and the ellies and the crocodile earlier. So terrapins are also called snapping turtles. Um, I know especially in the northeast of the states they're called snapping turtles. There's painted snapping turtles in the in the lakes there. So this tortoise being a vegetarian is wandering around looking for bits of grass. That's what I say he or she. I cannot uh, feel, I'm not going to go pick it up, it's too dry. Um, but you can't feel the, the bottom part of the carapace to see if there's an indent or not. If there's an indent, if it's a concave, then it will be a male. If it's flat or slightly convex, then it will be a female. Um, now, in other parts of South Africa, down in the south, on the coast, where you get Addo um, Elephant Park, you will get tortoises that are about six times the size of this tortoise, and they actually swim down there. Um, so leopard tortoise are the only tortoises that are known to swim. I've never seen a swimming tortoise. I've never been down to Addo. It's on my list of things to do, my ever-growing list. Very cool. So this is also known as Mfutsu, where we are here. So Mfutsu also means slow. And sometimes when we get flat tires, we say we are a three-legged Mfutsu. Check that tortoise is hungry. So <clears throat> we haven't really had rain, but this tortoise does live near the Chitwood Dam. There is a little bit more moisture, so it would have come out of hibernation, a specific type of hibernation called aestivation, where it's very dry and cold as opposed to wet and cold like you would get hibernation in Europe and North America and parts of Asia. Actually the other day I was out with Herbie who you guys saw this morning and Herbie pointed at a hole and he said Noel who's made the hole look like that and I looked at him and I was like Herbie I actually can't think right now and it was a tortoise it was a tortoise that had made the hole was was already there from a from a termite mound but it was a tortoise who had made the rounded edges to it and that's where that tortoise would have been for the very dry dry winter months. I 
Sammy Jane, you want to know, do tortoises mate at a certain type time of year? So super good question. Uh, they will mate when the uh, food and resources are optimal. So that's going to be more in the summer months, um, especially after the first heavy rains. They're not going to mate when they're busy acivating. Um, and it is particularly hilarious and, en <laughs> and enjoyable. I don't know why I say that, but it's just very funny. Tortoises mating is very funny. And the facial expressions on the males <laughs> is particularly epic. So it is something I will try and show you <laughs> for over the next few months. I'm sorry, I'm just picturing the last time I saw it, it had downpoured for probably a day and a half straight. We got something silly like 60 or 70 mils. This is uh, farther north uh, from where, where we are now. And we went on drive one day in the pouring rain and just weren't seeing anything. And then we came across these mating tortoises. And I think my guests and I stayed with those tortoises for a good 40 minutes and just laughed and laughed and laughed and took photos. It was absolutely, absolutely hysterical. So yeah, um, at certain times of year, so summertime when it when it's nice and wet and, uh, and they are able to expend the energy they need to expend and also put energy back in their body. So if they tried to mate when it was drier or tried to come out of acivation when, and, and mate then, they're expending energy that it's just not just not worth it for them. Very, very, very good question. All right, <clears throat> so we have a few little bookies in front of us here. Bookies are little antelopes. There's a little bit of uh, bird life. I just want to pull forward a bit. There was a starling that was sand bathing a bit in front of us. And then there was a plover. There's the little the little plover. So do you see here at about our 11 o'clock, it's running there. It looks like a tiny little blacksmith plover chick. Before I say too much, I just want to check with my bottles. Yes, it's a teeny tiny blacksmith plover chick that I would probably say was born in the last couple of days. That would be my guesstimation. Mum or dad has just landed down, is going tick, 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 tick basically saying to the little one, run away, run away from the big scary vehicle, get away, get away. And the little one's going, okay, okay. But notice he doesn't really know where to run. He keeps turning around and looking at mom or dad, going like, okay, I'm running away. <laughs> you see that? Just listen for a sec. Of course now it stops. Okay, mom or dad's now happy it, it's gone far enough away. But every time he stopped to, to do anything like eat or look back there, Mom's like, go, keep going. It's like being told if you have to go to your room when you're a bad child or if your, your parents have to deal with something hectic. The other thing that parents will do, especially when there's a young chick or an egg with these lap wings, they used to be called plovers, so excuse me sometimes if I use the old name, is one of them will, will make these calls or fly up around or, and then they'll pretend to have a broken wing display. So the, the like when jackals come, the jackals that you saw for instance with Scotty D up in the Mara, so one of the parents will pretend to hobble around and have this broken wing to, to uh, distract the predator away. I've actually never seen a broken wing display. I've seen the display that we're seeing just now and I've seen the parents dive bombing things like elephants to steer them away from where eggs are but I have not personally seen the broken wing display. I just know that it happens. I've also been dive bombed myself by many a lap wing as I've been doing bushwalk and not been as paying close attention as I should and come too close to, to the eggs themselves. Now just behind that beautiful little chick we have some impala rams that have come down for a little drink. It's actually looking quite beautiful. Backlighting's nice. So no, these are not the same plover tricks that, uh, tricks, chicks that Tristan has seen. Tristan was looking at a three-banded plover with tiny little chicks. There's the blacksmith lapwing that used to be called a plover. It's now a lapwing, much larger bird. I'm actually going to get my bird book out for you so as not to confuse anybody. Sorry, give me a second. So I have friends who can look through their bird book and know exactly what page everything is on. I still need to go to my index and then I am not a very good speller. So sometimes it takes me a little while. Okay, so this is the 
blacksmith lapwing that we're looking at now and this is a juvenile okay we were seeing one that's even smaller than a juvenile i think it was three afternoon shows ago when we were watching the crocodile hatchlings with Tristan, there was a juvenile like this when the dickops, the thick knees, were busy displaying at the hatchling, the crocodile hatchlings. There was one of these running around. So then you get the three banded plover. Here we go, here's the three banded plover, much smaller. So the blacksmith lapwing is going to be a little bit taller than my book and the three banded plover is gonna stand about where this plover sits from, from here up. So that's the size difference. So that tiny little chick, that one that you're seeing with Tristan is the one that was going up and under the mum or dad and just sitting under there. This little chick will do this with the adult. They're actually quite close to each other now. We'll do that with this adult, but not as much. The The blacksmith lapwings tend to want to have their babies like, go away, move away, move away. And they're gonna keep moving until they find a safe spot. And then if we're lucky, that little one will tuck himself up under, there's the little one there, under the parent. Yeah, yesterday or today, tiny little baby. Look, there they go. All right, fantastic. So we have done beautiful elephants. We've had some good birds. We've done a little bit of antelope. Uh, Jandre and I have been driving around placing bets on whether or not we're going to see a cheetah, um, it's not cheetah, sorry, leopard, and hoping we find something. The guys are talking a little bit about wild dogs and tracks. They haven't seen them. It's not on a property we can traverse. It's over on Torchwood, but I am keeping my ear out because wild dogs, both Jandre and I really want to see wild dogs. We saw our leopard yesterday. Now a wild dog would be fantastic. So we're going to carry on it's getting nice and cool you can actually see nicely there's a cold front pulling in so remember it was super 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 hot today it was 34 degrees celsius then we had that wind that picked up when we were on the dam wall now you see that cloud cover that's there that's a cold front moving in so tomorrow should be much cooler um, possibly with those overcast skies that we were having for a few days um, with Tristan last week um, and and that's that's going to pull through and, and change the dynamic of everything uh, for now so let's reverse and get out of this beautiful little niche little nook sorry is what I meant to say and see what else we can find that tortoise was great I love a tortoise you all will notice that over time I love everything so I have a hard time picking a favorite so today I've loved our elephants I've loved um, <laughs> I've loved our uh, tortoise I've loved our little baby plover everything is special and unique and interesting I'm also a girl Zoe, super good question. You're asking, do animals hibernate? So there's different types of hibernation. So Zoe, um, I, are you from a cold climate, a temperate climate where you get snow or maybe a lot of rain during your winter? Because if you are, then you will get a lot of species that hibernate because it's cold and wet. So you're from Illinois, Illinois. Yes, it gets very, very, very cold there in the winter. And um, I, I do know that you get a, a bit of snow. So you will get species that hibernate properly through those long, cold winter months. Here, our winter is very short, very dry, but still in, in relation, it's cold for us, but if you were to come here in winter, you'd be like, oh, it's not so bad. So they're more worried about desiccation, about the dryness that can occur um, in, in that scenario so that's what they're trying to do is conserve their energy and conserve the moisture and so they're aestivating type of hibernation check for tracks Jandre how excited would you be if the wild dogs just run out right now I would be over the moon I would probably squeal like a little girl yes just like that Jandre although maybe not as high pitched but that was good <laughs> There's, so Scotty D, your sun has already set up there in the Mara. Our sun is just about to set, but we are going to send you back to him to see what he is doing driving around. Maybe he finds one of the beautiful nocturnal creatures of the Maasai Mara. Hey 
one. Just been telling Manu about how much I'm missing chameleons and how sad I am that there's not as many as I was expecting to find in the Mara, because Kenya is a place where you get plenty of chameleons and some really incredible ones. So I was showing Manu some of my pictures from when I was here for two years between 2012 and 2014, and I just thought I may as well show you as well. How cool is this thing? This is the Von Hernels chameleon. They get a little bit bigger than the flap neck chameleons and they've got this big diplodocus like kind of helmet and a very fancy moustache very cool but that I mean that's pretty standard with most chameleons to be fair that's another shot of it more of its body and obviously like all chameleons they can and do change color this one's eyes not usually black another one same story and then this my favorite. This is a Jackson's three-horned chameleon. It is like a triceratops. <laughs> Very cool. Let me see if there's another angle. No, that's the Von Hommels again. No, no more. That's it. But you do get some chameleons here. I think we've I've seen one look like a flat neck chameleon, and Taylor's also seen one, but that was up on the top of the escarpment. We've yet to seen any, see any in the valley floor. I guess, I mean, it is mainly grassland, which isn't the ideal habitat for most chameleons. There's not too much woodland and trees for them to seek refuge in. But you do get some fairly big belts of forest in here. Big enough, you'd think, to house some chameleons. Anyway, we will keep scanning and searching and maybe we will get lucky. Failing that, you will just have to wait until Safari Live sets up their next location, which will hopefully have a few more chameleons for us to show you. So we've been lucky with the rain for now. There's a very slight drizzle falling. But we've got a huge belt of rain ahead of us. What is this here? We got it there, Manu. There's just some eyes, I thought, in the grass. Let me switch off. A little bit lower. There we go. You can see something glistening there next to that rock. What could you be? Huh. Maybe it's just a little insect or a spider. Sometimes their eyes often glow very brightly and can be deceiving. I was hoping it was going to be another rodent. <laughs> Manu, Manu and Taylor had the most awesome <laughs> sighting of some rodents making love the other night. Took everyone by surprise. Taylor initially thought they were about to have a fight and then they did just the opposite of that. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm not too sure what that is. We might have to get a bit closer, but what I would like to do while... Oops, sorry. Before we tr work out what that is, I would li is I'd like to try and show you this huge cloud of rain. Look at that. <laughs> That's where we're heading. It was better without the eye, Manu. Yeah, you can see that wall of rain now. And that's exactly where we're going. Our camp's just off to the left of that. And while we show you a gloomy scene here, we can try and get something a little bit better before we say goodbye and send you to a much brighter, sunnier scene. But there is still a little bit of light out to the west. Let's send you off to what I'm guessing is going to be a bit more of an impressive scene with Tristan. <laughs> A very, very warm welcome to St. Joseph's School from Canada on our afternoon safari. My name is Tristan and on camera today I've got Senzo and we're going to take you on a ride through the African bush and try and find you as many of the wonderful things that live out here as possible. Now remember that you can get hold of us and ask us any questions that you have, even if you have questions about any of the animals, the trees, the insects, 
any of those things and you can ask the questions to your teacher and she'll send the questions through to us and we'll try and answer as many as possible now where I'm sitting at the moment the Sun is just starting to set here in Africa we are at that time of the day where all the predators are going to start moving so things like lions and leopards and hyenas they're going to start coming out now and start exploring because it's been very hot today it was close to 92 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 degrees Celsius and so it's been warm for most of the day which meant that most of the cats have been sleeping and so what we're doing now is trying to see if we can find a leopard this morning I was very very privileged to be able to find a leopard in this area and so I'm looking for a little boy leopard that hangs around here and hopefully I'm going to be lucky so what I'm going to do is I'm going to check up this road and then I'm gonna come down and there's a water hole where this leopard likes to hang around and have a little drink so we're gonna go and check over there so that's the plan for the afternoon hopefully we will be lucky and that you will all have your leopard luck with you as we search for the most elusive cat of all of them out here in Africa the leopards can be very difficult to find but hopefully with a bit of luck we will be able to find him sitting somewhere in this area like I say I did see him very late in the morning and so I'm sure he's going to be around soon now I'm not the only one out here my friend Noel is also out and about and she's got probably the fluffiest of the antelope that we get here in South Africa. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We have a very special sighting for you. Not only is it one of my favorite antelopes, we have a male, a mum, a youngster, and a beautiful sunset behind a marula tree. It really, really doesn't get any better than that. So there's also a lot of bird noises that are happening at the moment. So I just want to sit quietly for about 10, 15 seconds and just see if we can pick up on all the gorgeous uh, dusk chorus that is happening around us while staring at these beautifully fluffy water buck. And now <laughs> we have a very eager youngster trying a little bit of dominance display. Obviously not going to work. It's not really his, uh, he's not old enough yet. It's not time for him to have kids. All right. So within that little herd structure that we saw there, we had that big, beautiful male that was in the background. So he has a huge set of horns. Anyone um, uh, that's been watching uh, lately, I don't know if you guys go home and you watch a little bit of the YouTube, we were discussing it a little bit. He's gonna be a dominant male and this is gonna be his herd of females. There's another dominant male that's farther down the way and they were staring at each other for a bit. And then this one that we were looking at laid down and basically was being submissive in his posture. So he's saying, I'm gonna take up this space as the sun sets um, and not allow, um, uh, not not infringe upon your territory that other male is going to go towards his female and lay down and then they're all going to sleep here for the evening oh look at these beautiful colors pulling through and there's that beautiful male water buck with his gorgeous horns little white circle around the bum now a lot of people say that circle on the bum is a follow me signal, so something that other water buck can follow through. Uh, but we've got up where Scott is in the Mar, you get the Defossa water buck. They don't have the circle, it's just a little bit of white. Um, also, it's, it's just such a perfect little circle. For me, it's just one of nature's mysteries. It just happens to be what it is. I don't think we are able to actually say why that is that. I think we as humans really love to put things in boxes and this is not a, 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 a example of, of a box we can do. I'm really loving, if we could pan out just a bit, Jandre, that little bit of um, sun that's peeking over that cold front coming through with the pink in the clouds. Oh, that's absolutely gorgeous. Okay, so the females have started to move away. The other male is actually moving up and that male has stood up. We might just get a little bit of action. If we do, we will definitely come back, but we are gonna head over to Tristan and see what sort of surprise he has in store for us. 
Look what we managed to find, guys. So we came along the corner and we spotted his footprints. And I knew that the footprints were very fresh because they were on top of the vehicles that had been driving here this afternoon. And out came our little boy leopard that we were looking for. So he's just on his afternoon patrol now. I was saying that this is the right time for him to be out and moving. And so it's the best part of the day is that it's cooler now and leopards start to move and they start to try and walk around in search of prey animals. So we've got him at just just the right time and I think I know where he's going to go he's probably going to head into an area where there's a nice water hole that he likes to spend time at and maybe he's gonna have a big drink you see he's got a big yawn there that's because he's just woken up right now so he's going to get going remember if you have lots of questions about a leopard send them through and we'll try and get them as much as possible Zarina, you're asking what my favorite animal is. Well, we're looking at it. This is my absolute favorite animal. I love leopards and I like to spend as much time as I can with them all the time. But Zarina, before I carry on, can you hear above me? There's a sound that's being made. So the sound that's being made is because of a squirrel that is sitting right there, just on the low branch end. So right there, you see the squirrel? Now the squirrel's upset to see the leopard. So it's shouting at everybody to tell everyone, I've seen a predator, everybody be careful. Amazing, eh? That's very cool. Now the leopard is going to probably move around, sniff around. So I'm going to catch up with him in case he goes the wrong way because he might turn the wrong direction. If he turns to my left, then he goes away from our area. If he turns to our right, then he's going the right way. So we're going to try and keep up with him, but he seems to be going the right way, which is fantastic news for us. But he's on his, like I say, his afternoon movement. He's not a dominant male yet. He's not a dominant boy. He's still very young. He's about 21, 22 months old now. And so he He's not able yet to mark his territory and scent mark. So what he does is he moves around trying to look for food until such time as he reaches about three years old, three and a half, which is when he's going to start establishing himself as a territorial male. And he's going to try and find a territory of his own that he can then dominate and scent mark and try and find females and mommy leopards to keep in this area. Now, I believe the school, you guys say thank you for showing a leopard. Well, it's my absolute pleasure. I love seeing leopards and I hope that you're going to really enjoy these leopards too and that we're going to have a wonderful rest of our safari with this male as he walks around. Now, I'm hoping, like I said, that he's going to go north and he's going to cut up towards this dam because it's going to be beautiful if he goes that way because there's a nice big water hole and he can have a really nice drink and with the sunset, it's going to be really good. Now, while our leopard starts to go to that water hole, we're going to quickly Go across to Noel, whose water buck are starting to fight. Fantastic! So they circled around each other, they judged each other's up. They, they looked like they were going to move away and now they've started a little bit of sparring. Now they don't always want to go, oh, like that one's moving away, now they don't always want to go and, and headbutt and do anything that could injure themselves. So a lot of the behavior you're seeing is, I'm bigger than you, no, I'm bigger than you, a little bit of tussling and then giving up a bit, but it, it's, it's a war, not a battle. So they're going to constantly be up and down. And then another variable that's happened is there's a little tiny, tiny baby that's popped up to their left near one of the females. So the, the male that's in charge of that little tiny baby, he doesn't necessarily want that little one to get injured at all. Look how cute and fluffy that tiny little one is. So he's going to possibly change his strategy or his tactic. Now, if we head back towards those two males, we might see what their posturing is going to happen now. Now, Leah, you want to know how old are these two males? They're going to be older than nine years old. So a water buck's probably going to live up to about 12 years, maybe a little bit longer. So I'm going to put these guys definitely around, around nine, maybe a bit older. They're nice, established, older, older, what we would call a bull. Great question, Leah. Oh, and this one's now being submissive. Just that little bit of, of fighting was, um, was too much for him. All right, we've got Scott up north of us in Kenya, and he has some wonderful hyenas that he wants to show you. Hopefully we might get lucky and hear their wonderful whooping cries in the Mara night. We sure do have hyena, and what's quite interesting is that there was just two youngsters, one of which is on the left. I'm not sure where the other ones disappeared to. They were lying next to one another, and then the bigger one in the middle came running in onto the scene, the youngsters got up and ran off. 
You can see this one's holding its tail up high, which is quite often the case when hyena are a bit excited. But I'm guessing they know one another because all is calm and peaceful now. Now, let's take a little bit further off to the left. It looked like that one hyena was looking at something. Let's see what's over there. There we go. Some elephant. And some lightning. How cool is that? What's also cool is we know that the elephants have just crossed the Mara River. You can see their legs are very dark and wet and welcome to all the school kids who are joining us Kyle you were hoping to see elephant well I bet you didn't think you'd be seeing elephants with lightning in the background like you're seeing now quite a spooky scene and we're up in Kenya in the Masai Mara it's already dark here not like Juma so we're in a different time zone and we're using a very special infrared camera so we're not shining any lights. It's just about pitch dark around us and it's been a rainy, stormy afternoon here. And as you can see, there's lots of lightning still around. Thankfully, that lightning is not going to be coming our way. That's going to continue away from us into Tanzania, the next country below us. Wonderful stuff. Oh, I'm hoping we don't get caught in a serious big cloud of rain that's up ahead of us. We're hoping to try and find you some lions before we get caught in the rain. And thankfully, while we look for the lions, you can be lucky enough to go back to Tristan with Hosanna. Well, we've still got our leopard, but listen, there's a sound like a dog barking to my left. You'll hear it every now and then. And you see his tail's in the air. So his tail's in the air because he's telling these kudu, which are the ones that are barking like the dog. They're coming on our left-hand side. You'll see them. Now, there's a whole bunch of them, and they're shouting at this leopard. They're alarm calling. They're saying, we've seen you. We know you're here. Don't come any closer. And they're the ones making that loud barking sound that we were hearing just now. He's obviously not too interested. Well, there we go. Look, he's coming towards them. He's growling at them. You hear them barking at him? Look at that. He's coming actually closer. I'm so surprised that he's going closer. The kudu will lose their nerve and they'll run. But there's too many kudu and they're too big and he doesn't have the advantage or the ability now to hunt them because he's a secretive animal. So he's what we call an ambush predator. An ambush means that he likes to hide and then wait for the animal to come and then he can surprise them. Now with this situation, these kudu have seen him. They know that he's there and so he has no more ability to surprise them and therefore it's very difficult for him to hunt them and he's going to leave them alone. He's moving off but the kudu are following to try and make sure and you see there's lots and lots of kudu coming out plenty of them that are moving through the thicket and they're coming all over to come and see this leopard so I think there's about nine or ten kudu here and these are our largest antelope so they're much bigger than some of the other antelope that we get in here Leah, you're asking what colors can leopards be? Well, this is actually a very good question. Some people might think it's a silly question because most leopards look like that, where they're a little bit kind of orangey with black spots all over them. But actually, here in South Africa, we get three different types of leopard. And so you get the normal leopard that looks like this, that, like I say, has got an orange coloration with black spots. Then you get what we call a melanistic leopard, which is completely black. It almost looks like a black panther. And so those leopards are incredibly rare. You very, 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 very seldom see them in fact we've I've never seen a black leopard myself and then you get what we call a strawberry leopard now strawberry leopard is known as leucism now leucism and melanism are two forms of color pigment in a cell so we have melanin which makes our hair color go dark and leucism which is if our hair color 
has a white pigment in it and so the white or strawberry leopard has a lot of leucistic capabilities and it means it's got a lot of white pigments and so the leopard appears very very light with very light spots and it almost looks like a light strawberry color and that's where it gets its name from so there's actually three different color forms of a leopard but the most common and what we see almost a hundred percent of the time the other two we very very seldom see is this color leopard and he's a beautiful color he's got a nice dark coat and males generally do have dark coats but he is going towards a termite mound so maybe we're going to get lucky and we're going to see him up on the mound itself he's also looking in some of the trees and he's been sniffing as we've been going so i think he's maybe smelt another leopard in this area i know that there was a female and a cub that came through here a few days ago and i think he's smelling the female and the cub and that's why he's looking in the trees in case there's a carcass that he can steal. Isabel, how many times do I do safari tours? Twice a day, Isabel. So early in the morning for us, because it's now nighttime on, in our area. So I do early in the morning. We get started at about five o'clock in the morning, and then we're out until about half past eight. And then in the afternoon, I go out again, and we start at about three o'clock, and we end at about half past six. So we have that those two periods and the reason why we do safari at those times Isabel is because it is the best time for all of the animals all right so there are some animals that move around during the day but they'll move around when it's in the afternoons they'll go and get water and they'll start to find places to rest and then as the Sun sets like I was saying to you just now so the cats start to move and this leopard comes out and he's now going to go into the night and try and hunt using the cover of darkness but we are going straight towards that dam that I was telling you about it's going to take us a bit of time to get there we obviously got to go through the bush and we got to follow this leopard and we're going to go over some trees and some bushes and then eventually we're going to pop out on the other side here but you'll see his nose is down on the ground the whole time and like I say he's busy following a female and cub scent because they both walked through this area and that's why he's picking up their scent so while I try and follow him through this thicket until we get to the dam on the other side let's go back to my friend Noelle who's made her way to the really very very big dam and I'm sure she's got lots of interesting things lurking around the water Welcome back, and how exciting was Tristan's leopard? Uh, we love a leopard around here. Myself and Jean-Dre, who's on camera, have not been lucky with the leopards, but we've had amazing, amazing other creatures to show you. Now, I've got a little surprise of my own that we're gonna come up, and they're gonna be very active and playful, hopefully. They are big, they live in the water, and they have feet. If you have any ideas what might be coming up, very shortly send through your questions <gasps> drew you want to know if there's penguins in africa and there are penguins in africa you can go down to boulders beach or betty's bay which is near cape town in the south western part of south africa and see penguins down there super exciting there are definitely there's african penguins in africa so anyone idea what are surprises i can see them now jandre is gonna zoom in we have a gorgeous pod of hippos so there's all the little youngsters around the bottom of that leadwood tree playing with each other they were gaping earlier so a gape is when they open their mouths and stick their bodies up heard a little bit of their sound just there Do all the safari drives love animals, Tracy? I think that's the question that we were asked. Um, yeah, we do. So Sophie, we do. We have to love people for one, but we also have to love animals and we have to really uh, love the ecosystem in which we are functioning in. And, and so for us, it's not just about loving the animals, but it's about being able to tell people like yourselves about what we do and show you what we do so that you also have a love of, of the African bushveld. That's a really great question. Little oxpeckers flying off from the top of that hippo. They've moved over to the left onto the little babies there. So hippos are super interesting. They spend most of their time in water, 
but as the sun goes down they're going to start especially the adults the little ones usually stay behind the adults are going to come out and they are going to eat grass they're a huge 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 animal and all they eat is grass <laughs> That older one is not being very nice to that little one, shame. And then they'll spend most of the night out foraging. The little ones will stay close to the dam and then as the sun comes up, they come back in. Oh, look at that beautiful gape and a little bit of playfulness with the chewing of the bark there. So hippos lose the most moisture out of their skin than any other mammal. Oh. My Isabel, you're wondering how many animals I've seen in total. Oh my goodness, Isabel, I did not study math very well at school, and it's one of my biggest regrets, I wish I had. So I'm not very good with the counting, but I would have to say thousands, thousands of animals. Now obviously many of those are gonna be the same species, but I think in general, if we had to do a species count of just mammals, I'm not gonna count birds. My bird list is somewhere around 450. Um, and then my mammal list is, yeah, probably 60 or 70 at this point. Quite a few. I've been doing this for long enough, but there's still a few things I need to see. I want to go to the Congo and see an okapi, which is like a funny mixture of a giraffe and a zebra. And I would love to see um, forest elephants so in the Congo, and I haven't seen gorillas or chimpanzees yet. So there's still a few big ones that I would love to see and add to my list. Thanks, Isabel. Great question. Abby, you're so welcome. We love hippos here at Safari Live, and especially when it's cool like this, and they are doing their wonderful gaping displays and, and playing around for you. Hippos are some of the best. Lexi, you're wondering if the hippos are trying to find food. At right this moment, they're not trying to find food. These youngsters are just playing, but the adults will shortly be going out to find food. So they don't really eat in the summertime mostly, and this can change, but in the summertime mostly, they don't really eat during the day. They just eat during the night. So they spend most of their time in the water during the day, sort of resting and relaxing. And now it's like when you wake up on a nice Saturday morning and you don't have to go to school and you can stretch in bed and then you get out and you play around a little bit and then maybe you have a late breakfast or a brunch. That's kind of what's happening here is they're playing around, they're stretching, and then they're gonna head off and start their process of feeding. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Jandre. So we've got a green-backed heron here, busy trying to fish. So he's at the water's edge, so there's tiny little fish in this dam. There's also some big fish in this dam. And he's going to see yesterday Tristan, who you saw earlier with his leopard. Tristan was here and had probably the same green-backed heron, who was also fishing and managed to catch a fish. So Jandre and his expert camera skills are keeping up with this now very quick green-backed heron who's obviously seen something that we can't see. So what he'll do is he'll sort of spear whatever fish he sees with that beak and then flip it up so that it goes lengthwise down his throat. You can hear the hippos starting in the background. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Leah, you're wondering how much a hippo weighs. A big male hippo can weigh up to about a ton. Uh, the females are gonna weigh around 600 to 800 uh, kilograms, roughly, just depending on, on the, the size of, of, of the hippo itself. If we actually go back just quickly, Jandre, you guys can see just not just the heads, but the back of one of them sticking out. So because they're in the water, you can't necessarily see the size. That, to me, is looking like a decent-sized male. So you can actually see how, how big they are. Oh, oh, here we go. Stand by one. Ah, wonderful gape. Ah. 
Ab Abby, very good question. So hippos do not breathe underwater. Um, they are mammals. If we head just a little bit to the left, you can see one of the females popping out there, or sub-adults and some of the little ones. Um, they are mammals like us, so they can't breathe under the water. They hold their breath, and they can hold their breath for 10 minutes, sometimes a little bit longer. <laughs> William, how do hippos clean their teeth? That's a really good question. So William, hippos are lucky enough that they don't <laughs> have to go to the dentist and have to have their teeth cleaned. They just carry on life as normal and because they eat a lot of grass, which they basically pull up with their lips, they don't need to do too much dentistry. Um, you will see the older they get, the more yellowy their teeth get. Uh, but un uh, luckily, I would say, I don't know, I actually like brushing my teeth and flossing. I mean, it's for the people who don't like brushing their teeth and flossing, being a hippo would be good. William, I'm wondering if you've maybe read that book. It's a wonderful storybook about the little bird that sits in the hippo's mouth and the crocodile's mouth and cleans out a, a, a bit of their teeth. I remember seeing that when I was a kid. All right, so we are going to leave our hilarious hippos and head back towards Tristan, who has a fantastic leopard to keep showing you. I do indeed, and this leopard is really very, very interesting because he's smelling all around this tree, and there's actually dung for a little leopard a cub just in front of his face there. There is a little bit of dung, and so he's smelling it to try and see who this is. In fact, that's not actually leopard dung. I thought it was, but it's not. It's something else. But you see, look how he's smelling. And if we keep quiet enough, we can actually hear him sniffing. Now look what he's doing. You see, he's showing his teeth. So what he does is he's got an organ in the roof of his mouth. Now an organ is something like your brain or your lungs or something like that. And it's called the organ of Jacobson. And that's able to tell what that chemical is that he's smelling. So is it a male? Is it a female? If it is a female, does she have cubs? Does she not? So he's very, very clever way of working out who's around him. Yeah, yes, I have seen two leopards fighting. It's not very nice to watch because I love leopards and I don't like to see them fighting. But you'll find sometimes they do fight over territory. So I've seen males and females fight a lot. Oh, look at this. That's so interesting. This young male is too young to be in a territory, like I was saying just now. But he's scent marking, which is a sign that he's now trying to establish a territory. This is the first time I've ever seen this young male scent mark. Now, the difference between scent marking and urinating is when they go to the toilet and they make a wee, they'll just squat when they're young males and they just wee on the ground. But what he's done is he's lifted his tail and he's projected his urine onto the tree. And that means any leopard that walks past it's at nose level and they know that there's a male that is marking here and is trying to set up a territory it is very interesting because it's the first time that we've seen this young boy do that and it's going to be a difficult thing for him to do because he's now telling any other males that I am in this area and the big dominant male here the father of this leopard or the daddy leopard he's going to chase him away if he finds out that this boy is scent marking because he knows then that it's going to be a threat to his females and to his mom and to his cubs so they have to be able to try and then protect the area and that male will chase this young male away if he's marking territory and we're going to try and keep up with him because he is walking he's still going towards the dam we're not too far away from that water hole where he will go and drink eventually but the scent of this female is making him walk quite slowly he's sniffing all over the place so typical boy he's getting distracted very quickly we know boys can't do two things at once and so he's getting distracted now of course that's just a joke boys can do two things at once we're very capable of doing that look I'm even driving and talking at the same time very clever aren't I but we're not too far away now we should be coming slowly but surely towards the water he's going to move through this area and you can see why a leopard is very difficult to find look at how well he camouflages if you see from where I'm sitting 
it's very difficult to see him. His spots blend in very well, and so he is an animal that hides in plain sight. And so if we hadn't found him when we did, by using his footprints to go in the direction that he headed, I don't think we would have found this leopard tonight. So it's amazing to watch leopards as they walk through the grass. They really do camouflage and blend in very, very well. Right, let's keep up with him because I don't want to lose him while he goes towards the water. Of course, I know he is going to go to the water, but I don't want to lose him before he gets there in case he does change direction. You never know 100%. I'm 99% sure, but you never know 100% that he's going to go there. Right, now I've got to be careful of all the little stumps and trees that have been pushed over by all the elephants that we get here. So you'll see lots of trees that are down and broken and those can be damaging to the car. So I have to watch a little bit while I'm going and make sure that I don't hurt the car in any way. But the road is not far now. I can actually see the road luckily, which is good news. And so hopefully we'll be on the road fairly shortly. Bryn, we can maybe see zebra. I haven't seen any zebra this afternoon. Where Scotty is in the Masai Mara is a great place for zebra and maybe he'll be able to find them. I'm not sure if we'll see some here. I haven't seen any yet, but maybe at the dam, you never know. Maybe the zebra are sitting at the dam and we'll be able to watch them from there. So you look, he's still moving slowly but surely towards the water. Look at the sunset in the background. Now Evangelina, leopards have a very, very big amount of food that they can eat. So they'll go after lots of different things from insects, if you can believe it, all the way through frogs, snakes, um, tortoises, terrapins, even up to as big as baby giraffe and elephant. So they have a very, very, very wide amount of food to be able to go after. What you'll find though is most of the time they hunt what we call small to medium antelope. So like deers that you get in Canada, the same thing. So those kind of size animals is mostly what they go after. They also will hunt things called scrub hares. Now scrub hares are almost like a rabbit and so that's also part of their food source that they go after. The bigger they get though, the bigger the animals that they're able to hunt. Right. Right, now I'm just trying to get through this little thicket. Serena, you're wondering how many teeth a leopard has. Oh, Serena, I've, I really honestly have forgotten now how many, but we can maybe try and count them. They have one, two, three, four incisors in the front. So four of these teeth here on top and bottom. So that's eight. Then they've got four canines, which are the big sharp ones that come down. So there's those. And then, so that's already 12. And then we've got, Ooh, how many carnations do they have? They have, I think it's six in total. I might be wrong, it might be five, but I think it's six. And so they have six on the bottom on both sides and on the top on both sides. So that's 12, 18 plus the other 12. So it's close to 30, I think 28 or 30. Somewhere there is about how many they've got. I might be wrong. I can't remember exactly, but I think it's somewhere around that area. You see his tail's up again? It's because the birds were shouting at him. So he's just giving his white tip of his tail like a white flag to say that I'm surrendering. I don't want you to shout at me. Stop making a lot of noise and we can hopefully then stay nice and quiet. But the dam itself is very, very close now. We, we're right here so we should be going to the dam shortly, but while we try and get there before he starts drinking, let's quickly jump back to Noel, who's got some animals that love to be in the dam just as much as this leopard's going to love having a drink from it. Hello, we've got our baby hippos. They're out a little bit more, teeny tiny baby hippos, and they're busy playing and wrestling with each other having a fantastic time as they wake up in this balmy, balmy evening. I hope you all enjoyed Tristan and his leopard, and hopefully Hasana will go and have a drink for us, and we'll be able to watch that a little bit later. Natasha, you asked a fabulous question. Do hippos open their eyes underwater? And yes, Natasha, they can open their eyes underwater. They can close their nostrils, close their ears, and close their eyes all independently of each other. And when they're underwater, they can actually see underwater. And they can hear underwater, not through their ears, but through their lower jaw, through reverberations in their lower jaw. It's very neat. Great question, Natasha.
This one's giving us the hairy eyeball. There, he's gonna go look underwater now. Communicate with his fellow hippo underwater. So a group of hippos is known as a pod or a raft of hippos. So Lexi, the hippos stay underwater holding their breath, sometimes up to 10 minutes or a little bit longer. And then on a hot, hot day like we had today, they're gonna stay in the water all day long until the sun goes down. So one of the main reasons, Lexi, is when they're out in the, in the sun, the sun is very strong for them and it burns their skin and it also takes most of the moisture out of their skin as well, which is not healthy for them. So they um, spend their time in, during the daylight hours in the water so that they don't get sunburned and they don't dehydrate. And then now waking up and it's going to be dark very shortly, then they can travel around without getting sunburned and without dehydrating and conserving their energy a little bit. So they probably spend about eight to 12 hours of the day in the water. We are going to head back to Tristan with his cheeky little leopard, hopefully having a drink and giving you all an amazing visual. Well, we are going to catch up with him now. We're just going towards the water hole. You'll see there is a vehicle in front of me that is just letting us come past. So thank you, Aubrey. And so they are out on a safari. These are people that have come to the reserve to be able to come and see these animals and to be able to get to know them. So I'm gonna go around onto the other side of the dam. And the reason why is because I think this leopard is going to drink from this side and I want to be on the opposite side so I can see his face when he does drink. And that's the idea anyway, whether or not it does work, I'm not quite sure. Kadri, no, leopards are not faster than cheetahs. Cheetahs is the fastest land animal in the world. So they are much faster than what a leopard is. A leopard runs at about 70 kilometers an hour, whereas something like a cheetah is going to be doing close to 120 if conditions are right. Probably more around 110 to 100, but still much faster than what you're seeing from a leopard. Now he should be just on the other side there and hopefully he's going to come across onto our side. I've lost visual of him now. I can't actually see him. So I'm just waiting for him to come. He should come from there. Hunter, you're asking how do leopards clean their bodies? Well, Hunter, basically what they do is they have a very interesting tongue. Their tongue has got rough, rough, rough hooks on it. It almost feels like sandpaper. And so as he cleans and he licks himself with his saliva, it acts like a brush and it takes all of the dirt and the parasites and loose fur. It's like brushing your cat or your dog. It's the same thing and they get them nice and clean and that's how they keep themselves very clean. Cats don't like water, so they won't go swimming or try and wash in the water. They're going to clean themselves by licking and trying to get rid of everything using the rough, rough tongue. Now, our leopard should be coming from over there. He was straight across on that side. So theoretically, he should be coming down towards where we are. There's some Egyptian geese that are around. So those Egyptian geese, as soon as the leopard comes, are going to go flying off. He might actually even be stalking those Egyptian geese. He might be watching them. In fact, I can actually see him. He's on the other side and he is watching the Egyptian geese. So he's just over on the left-hand side above the green bushes. Sends. So just a little bit to the left. To the left sense so you need to go in otherwise we're not going to be able to see him because it's going to be very dark so just on top of those to more to the left more to the left okay straight over the top there there he is he's just on the other side there should be able to see him behind the bush I can see him just standing there maybe it's difficult with the camera angle maybe I'm wrong actually that it might not be there but I thought I saw him moving through that direction and watching the Egyptian geese itself but maybe not Maria, the reason why leopards have spots is because anything out here that has a plain color, it means that it's easy to spot it, it's easy to see it. And so a leopard has the spots which makes it break up the outline and makes it more difficult for us to be able to see them. And because a leopard is a shy animal, it likes to hide in deep, dense, dark thickets. It means that the best way to blend in is by having spots. It also, because of the area that they like to spend time in, has both shade and light. That means that the light color and the light orange and then the dark spots means that they blend in even better and it becomes much harder to be able to see them. And so that's why they have those spots. It is the perfect coloration. Now, I don't know where our leopard's gone. I thought he would have come straight down to the water itself to have a little drink. I left him right there coming this way 
towards us and so I was hoping that he would come and drink but it seems as though he's going to be a bit naughty and maybe he's moved off a little bit. The other vehicle is here and they're going to try and look as well and see if they can spot him as well. Now Bridget you're wondering how much a leopard weighs well it depends on the area that you look at them so here in this particular section we're in a savanna where there's a lot of prey animals and so the leopard can eat a lot of different food items and they get very very big and so the big male leopards here will weigh about 180 to 200 pounds if they're very large whereas a female will weigh about 100 to 110 if she's lucky in other areas of South Africa, so if we go into the Cape, which is down in the southwestern corner of the South Africa where there's mountains, the mountain leopards are much, much smaller. They don't have the same food that they can get to. They hunt mostly birds and lizards and little things called hyraxes, and so they weigh much less. A big male leopard there will weigh the same as our female leopards and weigh around 100 pounds or 50 kilograms around that area, whereas a male leopard, I mean, sorry, a female leopard will weigh anywhere between 20 and 30 kilograms, whereas our female leopards, like I say, weigh about 50 50 kilograms or 100 pounds so it's just a bit different depending on where you are in the area but I have honestly no idea why he hasn't come down I thought he would have walked straight towards the water he was moving exactly in this direction and so maybe it's just a situation that he's being kind of stopped and is watching the geese or he's spotted something and he's laid down a little bit but he's somewhere on that left hand side and I'm hoping that he will eventually come meandering and waddling down towards this particular section. What I might do is just go a little bit further forward so I think he's in that section there guys are shining a light in that direction just to spot and just to see if they can see him so somewhere over there is where he was walking now I thought I saw him sitting there somewhere but I can't anymore so I don't know if he's maybe laid down or what he's done but it seems as though he's not coming towards us this side so I'm just gonna try and reposition so we can get one last view of our leopard because we don't want a situation where we don't get to see him one last time because he is beautiful so let's just try and go around this way and not fall into the water because we don't want to get everybody wet and the cameras wet but let's just see Oh, it's very, very bouncy, so maybe it's going to take me a bit of time to get there. Kadri and Maria, you're wondering why lions are called the kings of the jungle? Well, it's very simple. It's because lions are the biggest of the predators. So they're very, very large and they are able to basically dominate which means that they are strong enough to chase all the other predators away and to hurt all the other predators and so that's why they're called the king and that's why they've gotten that name actually out here elephants are the biggest of them all so now Senzo have you spotted him where is he 12 o'clock I don't see him maybe Senzo can see him so oh, there he is he's just sitting by the bush sniffing around and having a little smell so I'm pretty sure he's going to eventually come down towards the water but at least we got to see him it's perfect perfect to get one last look now unfortunately it is that time of the day where we unfortunately finish our safari and we start to head back to our homes I hope that all of you have had an absolutely wonderful afternoon with us and enjoyed seeing this beautiful male leopard as it walks towards us in the dark light look at how pretty he is so I really hope that you've loved the leopard and the hippos and all the other animals that we managed to show you this afternoon. It's been an absolute pleasure from Scott all the way in the Maasai Mara to Noel and her hippos to myself and the leopard and all the camera ops. Kirsty and FC, we've had a wonderful time and we'll see you all on the Sunrise Safari tomorrow.